going to get started here. Thank you for making time to come out to our City Commission meeting. Um, I'm going to call to order the July 23rd, 2018 Royal Oak City Commission meeting to order. We're going to begin with an invocation given by Mayor Pro Tem Douglas, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand if you can. I spoke the other day with a resident, a minister, who's deeply interested in the upcoming work of our Senior Citizens Task Force. He wants to make sure that our older residents can live comfortably and with financial security. Whatever form that may take, he said, it must start with compassion. Whenever we see people in need, those who are ill or indigent or immigrants or just different, let us make our first instinct compassion. Let us make Royal Oak's lasting legacy as a city the kindness and generosity, the compassion of its people. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please remind you about civil discourse in this meeting hall? This is not the commission's meeting, this is the community's meeting, so I kindly remind you to follow and respect the rules of the commission. All right, that brings us to item number four on the agenda, the presentation of Mind Over Matter check. Julie. Thank you. Uh, my name is Julie Farr. Oops, and I live at 1930 Larome Drive. Uh, I started the local nonprofit organization Mind Over Matter, lovingly referred to as Mom, after losing my mom to schizophrenia and suicide in 2005. I immediately knew I needed to turn my pain into purpose and try to prevent others from going through what my family and I endured. So my siblings and I started the annual Mom Race for Mental Health Awareness and Suicide Prevention right here in Royal Oak in 2006. The residential road race takes runners and walkers of all fitness levels on a five kilometer tour through some of Royal Oak's finest family friendly neighborhoods and starts and ends at Star JC Park right across the street from where my family lived for 20 years. It's an extremely personal event that brings families, friends, survivors, mental health advocates and weekend warriors together to broach the often unspoken spoken topics of mental illness and suicide. The 13th annual mom, excuse me, the 13th annual mom race took place on Saturday, May 5th, and drew more than 1,400 participants from southeastern Michigan and beyond. I am pleased to announce that, with your support, the 2018 mom race raised another $50,000 for local brain research, suicide prevention programming, and crisis intervention services. Representatives from the University of Michigan Depression Center, No Resolve, and Common Ground are here to say a few words about how the mom race funds will be used by their charities. But before I turn the mic over to them and distribute the checks, I'd like to share something new and exciting that I'm working on. The city that we live in is changing right before our eyes. In the words of Mayor Fournier during his, re his recent State of the City address, Royal Oak is not a place to exist, it's a place to live and thrive. That's right, we're not just growing taller, building a new civic center, expanding retail and office space, building new hotels, and pouring money into our parks and roads. We are listening to our residents and learning ways that Royal Oak can celebrate diversity and become a more accepting, caring, and welcoming community. I cannot be more proud of the direction our city is heading. We all know that change can be difficult, but the result is progress. And part of that progress should also be the way in which we care for our fellow citizens who might be coping with mental illness or dealing with the loss of a loved one to suicide. U.S. suicide rates are at a 30-year high, and our city is not immune from this tragic epidemic. On average, here in Royal Oak, more than 10 adults die by suicide each year based on ROPD data over the past eight years. And this doesn't even begin to capture the number of suicide attempts that come through our hospital doors, the majority of attempts that go unreported, and the alarming increase in suicidal teenagers. Although it's not always obvious, people right here in Royal Oak are struggling with depression and other debilitating mental illnesses, dealing with increasing stress and anxiety, isolation and loneliness. This is a perfect storm for suicide and we need to do more to keep our Royal Oak community safe. I have spent the past 13 years building the Mom Race, a vehicle for raising $350,000 for life-saving programs and initiatives. While I cannot be more proud of the way the funds have been used by our carefully selected charities, I would like to begin allocating a portion of Mom Race funds to fill gaps right here in our Royal Oak community. 
With that, I am setting aside $5,000 of this year's Mom Raise proceeds to help restart Royal Oak Suicide Prevention Task Force, an initiative ori originally started by former Commissioner Peggy Goodwin that was short-lived from 2013 to 2014. While I'm still in the early planning phase, as my goal is to pull together a multidisciplinary team of passionate community leaders to put on a variety of outreach and awareness events throughout the year, the mission is to bring mental health to the forefront and make suicide prevention a shared priority. Some goals I have are to create regular town hall discussions that highlight mental health, legal, and other local resources, and arm law enforcement, teachers, and emergency room workers with the best crisis intervention training. I'd also like to ensure that all Royal Oak middle school and high school students receive suicide prevention programming at multiple points throughout their secondary education. And lastly, I'd like to continue to work on changing public perception right here in Royal Oak and reducing the stigma that prevents so many from getting the help they desperately need. Please look for more from me on the Royal Oak Suicide Prevention Task Force in 2019. In the meantime, here are our 2018 charities to accept their $15,000 checks and say a few words about how the funds will be used. Let's start with um, Stephen Taylor from the UMM Depression Center. Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, I just really want to express my deep gratitude to you and your family for really taking what was a tragedy and turning it into something inspiring and empowering and very impactful. And I'm, I'm delighted to hear of, of new initiatives. I think yeah, I'm not surprised with your energy and what you've been able to do with the mom race, uh, that, that you will continue to do things that will uh, impact our, our community and uh, particularly um, raise the um, uh, awareness about mental illness and suicide. I think that's one of the important things that the, that the mom race does is raise that awareness. Um, I'm also very thankful to the citizens of, of um, Royal Oak, uh, commissioners and mayor, uh, for allowing this to continue. The citizens who every Saturday uh, give up the access to their driveways and their streets for about three or four hours. Just um, one Saturday. Yeah. One Saturday, one Saturday. <laughs> but it's for an important cause, and I think that the, the um, uh, that raises awareness by itself, and, and I think that the, the results are, are definitely uh, being felt. So um, I'm from the University of Michigan, the Depression Center, Department of Psychiatry. Uh, we do teaching, um, training of people, uh, clinical care, but also research. And this will go to support research into mental illness, uh, into what goes wrong in the brain when a person has depression or suicide or psychosis, and finding better ways to treat people who have these really horrible disorders. But I, I want to just leave everyone with one um, note that uh, Julie had mentioned suicide rates have been increasing, but there is help out there and treatment actually works really quite well. It needs to work better, but there is still a lot that we can do. It's just sometimes a matter of people reaching out and being able to, to find the, the access to the help that they can benefit from. So thank you again. All right, and um, next up is Dennis from No Resolve. Thank you, Julie. Uh, my name is Dennis. I'm the president and founder of No Resolve, a um, local nonprofit organization dedicated to youth suicide prevention and awareness. I started this organization in 2007 in honor and memory of my dad, uh, who I lost to suicide as a teenager. And uh, it was important to me for that reason to, to reach out, to speak up, and to try to do something about this. Um, so this, this money is going to help us reach thousands of students this upcoming year to teach them about mental health awareness and suicide prevention fundamentals and to spread the message that it's okay to speak up, it's okay to ask for help, um, and that um, you're not alone even, even when you feel that, even when you believe it. Uh, the worst part about going through stuff like this is how alone you feel and how forever it feels. And w we exist to let people know that um, Again, you're not alone. There's a lot of people that go through this. There's a lot of people that get through it. And um, we, we hope that by getting out there and spreading that message, we can prevent um, further youth suicides. Uh, with Julie's help and, and the citizens and people of Royal Oak through this event and other events we put on through, throughout the year, uh, we've been able to reach out uh, so far to more than 120,000 uh, students and teens in Oakland and Macomb County. So thank you, Julie, very much. And last up is Jeff Kapazinski from Common Ground. 
Thank you, Julie. Uh, she said, my name is Jeff Kapusinski. I'm the Director of Development at uh, Common Ground. On behalf of my colleagues and the over 80,000 people that Common Ground helps on an annualized basis, I would like to say thank you to the City of Royal Oak, this council, and uh, obviously uh, Julie and her team for putting on the Mind Over Matter race. This event has quickly grown into one of our largest fundraisers, and we're grateful to be part of it. Last year, I spoke about our desire to expand our chat and text service. Uh, we were only offering the service five hours a day, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, excuse me, six hours a day, five days a week, and we felt like that important form of communication needed to be expanded. I'm proud to say that earlier this year, we achieved our goal and took that service 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, but the work is not done. That's one important avenue for people uh, seeking help, uh, reaching out for a lifeline. Uh, we, we also want to expand our mobile teams. These groups of uh, folks go out into the community, wherever people may be in crisis, to help them de-escalate, whether that's in a hospital, whether that's in their home, place of work, wherever it may be. Uh, that's next on our list, and we're eager to get started on that. I just want to again say thank you to the community of Royal Oak and Julie and her team for this outstanding event. Thank you. Thank you. You know, what can we say? I mean, you do an amazing job with the race. You do an amazing job bringing awareness of this very important subject in our city. And of course, you know, raising money for these fine institutions to carry on the good work that they do. So on uh, behalf of this commission here, and behalf of the city of Royal Oak, we're grateful for your efforts. Thank you. I'm grateful to do the work. Okay, this brings us to number five on the agenda, which is the presentation of the League of Michigan Bicyclists Community Support for Bicycling Award. Um, due to an unforeseen circumstance, uh, we won't actually have a presentation for this award, but uh, I do have some things to, uh, or something to read here. Um, so uh, the Community Support for Bicycling Award is given for activities that support making Michigan a better place to bicycle. Royal Oak's support of its bicycling community makes this award well-deserved. Royal Oak's goal of incorporating pedestrian and bicycle amenities into every public works project has led the city to identifying a major north-south bike route through the city. This summer, the city will be installing approximately six miles of dedicated bicycle lanes. Congratulations to the city of Royal Oak. So the city did win this award due to the fine efforts of many people People in the community, um, the folks that came out uh, earlier this year and last year to review all the plans and provide their feedback and input to Mr. Callahan and his engineering team uh, for working um, with residents and cyclists and traffic planners to come up with a plan and, and you know, I guess the award will be shipped. So we got it. All right. So this brings us to item number six, public comment. Um, we got a couple things going on here tonight. We have some public hearings, so I'm just going to kind of read the rules of, of what we have going on here tonight. So uh, the City Commission values and relies on the input of our fellow citizens to make decisions. Now is the time set aside for the public to address the City Commission on any city-related issues, both on the agenda and not. I ask that comments be directed to the City Commission as a whole and not to individual commissioners. In addition to public comment, there will be two public hearings at tonight's meeting. If you're here to comment on the vacation of the public easements for the Royal Oak City Center project or vacation of rights away for the new city hall, you may wait until the public hearings are opened and you can comment at that time. And again, the same rules that we have for public comment will apply to those public hearings. Uh, if you wish to speak tonight um, at either public comment or any of the public hearings, please wait until recognized by me, the mayor, come up to the podium. We ask that uh, for the record, you state your name and address and be mindful that the commission does want to hear from everyone who wishes to speak tonight. So comments are limited to three minutes or less. And uh, there's a timer at the podium right up here, bright red, uh, to help you keep track of your allotted time. If you don't wish to speak tonight, that's all right. Many of you reach out to us uh, in between meetings and share your comments. 
Uh, please note that the City Commission will not respond directly to questions during public comment. However, we are taking notes. Um, City Manager Don Johnson is taking notes and we'll address those questions you bring up when the agenda topic comes up. So we're writing them down and we're going to ask your questions to staff if appropriate. Um, and if your item is not on the agenda, I know Mr. Johnson is um, taking notes and does follow up on issues uh, accordingly. So um, how many are here tonight to talk about Royal Oak Manor? Okay, so maybe Mr. Johnson, I'll, I know it's an agenda item later, but before we start public comment, maybe you can kind of give a quick update on the past situation uh, with Royal Oak Manor in case there's any uh, confusing or misinformation out there. Uh, okay, let me bring up the actual report. I just move the For those of you who are here, we... Actually, it's not an action item. It's so. not an action item, so we can bring it up as an update, I suppose. The action last week? Yeah, last week. Yeah. Uh, the action that's actually occurred is that uh, we've issued more passes. We're reserving 31 passes for residents of Royal Oak Manor. Uh, I believe the procedure is they have to actually be purchased within before two weeks before they're, they're needed, because after that point, they're going to be available to anybody. Uh, at time of this writing, 11 of the 31 passes for July have already been purchased. Uh, the history on this goes back a long ways. It goes back to 1970 when the manor was built. Uh, the reason there's a parking shortage is because the, the, the company building the manor asked for and received a parking variance. Uh, really, the manor should have put in over 400 parking spaces. They were only required to put in 70. Uh, so that will resolve the problem for a short period of time. Uh, when uh, that property goes over to uh, Barton Katzman, who's going to be building an office building on it, uh, they have agreed that they will allow parking by seniors in the, their parking structure when it's done. But during the construction period, there will not be any nearby parking available. Uh, the city would probably be willing to allow uh, seniors to park in other Royal Oak parking structures, but none of the others are close. So, Seventh Street, Mr. Yeah, I mean, we there are alternatives we can look at, but I think at this time, Mr. Johnson, it's fair to say that for the short term, we're getting the passes and making them available so everybody has them. Yes. For the medium term, we're evaluating during when construction commences yeah, where the possibilities are uh, for the most convenient as possible parking for Royal Oak Manor residents and for um, the long term Burton Katzman and for the long key? term there's a resolution I think the Burton Katzman too because it's now going under private control has offered to to do yes. it at the former rates as well um, which is uh, you know in the long term I think the best best approach but in the short term we were kind of surprised here that last time that you, for whatever reason passes weren't made available so we've solved that one right away we could do that one we flipped on the switch um, and they're available so but in the medium term we still have a challenge here so and I think in this memo here when we get to it there is an acknowledgement there that says okay well we you know we still have work to do to bridge the time between the commencement of construction and when the building's done and so um, I, I'll be the first to admit we haven't resolved that just yet, but we're going to need your help and we're going to need the help of your management at Royal Oak Manor to figure that out. So before we go to public comment, I just want to make sure all of you guys were aware because we're not getting to this agenda item <laughs> to a little later. So uh, if you haven't got your passes yet, Mr. Johnson, what's the best way to, to get right, the passes? Right now the process is to go to the treasurer's office. We would actually prefer to be dealing with the manor as a group, uh, but that hasn't been arranged yet. Okay. Um, and then are these passes good till September or they'll get a series of passes? Oh, there's up three till different, there's, there's passes for July, August and September, and but it doesn't have to be month to month. They can walk away. Well, I guess July's done with August and September passes. Uh, I am not sure how they're handling that part. Okay. Well, we'll get some yes. follow up. Yes. Is that correct. They will yes. sell okay. all three of those. And, and the two week um, limit isn't applying to August. So they'll have time to get their August passes yeah. since we're already up there. Yeah, we're already, so we're going to waive that two week period for August. So no worries <laughs> if you get in there before August commences. Commissioner Perush? 
just very quickly, it, it, this is kind of a good news, bad news aspect to this whole issue. Um, the bad news is that the parking issue is, is a problem. There aren't enough spaces there for the residents that are in the building. The good news is that when that building was built in 1970 and the seniors all moved in, 70 spaces was more than enough. There were empty spaces. But the good news is that these, this, Seniors these days are living a lot longer, they're healthier, they're more mobile. My mother is 95, she still drives, she still drives well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and at their senior center, they have adequate parking. But, uh, but, but as we've seen these demographic shifts change and seniors get more and more active and able to carry on for a lot longer periods of time, more and more of them have cars. And so the demand is, is exceeding what the capacity of the lot is. So th that's a wonderful thing. Um, but it certainly wasn't the case in 1970 when the building was built. So you know, we'll, we'll try our best to make this all work. But it's, it's, it's a challenge, for sure. Yep. OK. Um, I guess, so now that we have that out there, um, I just want to make sure everyone knows kind of the latest status. And, and earlier, as opposed to having you wait <laughs> all, uh, all evening to get that answer. So um, I'll open it up for public comment. Who's first? Um, I think I saw the hand in the back first. Yes, ma'am? I'm Laura Rendon. I live at 911. Oh, come on up to the, po come up to the podium. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, we want to make sure we hear you loud and clear. And <laughs> I'm a teacher, so I don't, I'm used to not needing one of these. Um, anyways, I'm Laura Redman. I live at 911 North Connecticut. And um, I've been a proud Royal Oak uh, City Homer for 16 years, um, an avid voter, a taxpayer, and I, and I love living here. Um, so I, I even started a group in 2008 called uh, the Royal Oak French Meetup, and I've brought in people from Royal Oak, surrounding communities, and even international communities to our Royal Oak establishments, and I'm proud to do so. I'm helping one of my friends who wanted to leave Rochester Hills, and I said, there's no better place to live than Royal Oak. I'm currently helping her find a place where she can live downtown. So I, I love what we're doing with Royal Oak. Um, this is my first time speaking to you tonight, and I am doing so in regards to what I believe is Agenda 17, where Assistant City Manager James uh, Crison will propose ways to improve how we reduce our stormwater flooding in Royal Oak. I applaud this effort, though I am concerned about some statements in the news um, where he is quoted as saying it's unfair to put most of the burden on business owners, so we should, quote, eliminate the stormwater detention ordinance that exempts residents. Uh, I'm thinking this will put a higher tax burden on residents um, four years after the flood and in time for Boji's development downtown um, after we gave away an estimated two to three million in city parking for a dollar and granted 5.5 million to help this private business develop. I believe it is in the best interest of Royal Oak not to further tax our residents but to focus on credits for those who reduce our <coughs> low and our sewers. Many other residents expressed similar dismay about this aspect at least reported of his proposal and um, one person um, uh, and I really appreciate uh, Commissioner Perouche for for commenting on this and saying residents have been paying for the stormwater discharge forever. Um, but it seemed a contradiction to me that Creason is saying we aren't paying and yet I, we're also being told we've been paying the whole time. So I'm hoping this seeming contradiction is answered tonight. Um, as the lion's share of the city's coffers we've entrusted you with do come from residents, we want a thriving community, but not at the expense of rising taxes. One person on this site told me that um, you wouldn't listen to me. They even said, you will seriously get more interest and better response talking to your shoes. Um, well, city commissioners, my shoes can help Royal Oak, um, but you can. Uh, by not approving the removal of the tax exemption for residents of this city. So thank you so much for listening to me and, and for such a great city. Thank you, Ms. Rep. Yes, sir. My name is John Renaud. I'm from Warren, Michigan. 
I came here today for a special reason. I, I tried to call the city manager's office today on an incident that happened to me in Warren. Um, I was approached today at a Kroger's on 11 Mile in Hoover by a young man with a petition to recall our mayor and the city of Warren. Uh, the recall was for term limits. So I asked the young man, I said, uh, well, who, who's putting this thing together? And he says, well, I don't know. I'm getting paid by the city attorney from Royal Oak by the name of Mark Liss. They said, now, wait a minute. I don't, wait, he's paying you. He says, yeah, he's paying us to get these petitions. And uh, he's also uh, comes by and collects our signatures that we get during the day. So I thought, I said, I'm going to call the city of, War or city of Royal Oak. This guy's working for the taxpayers. These people here are struggling with their, I just found out, with their parking issues. And this guy's working on city time to overthrow the Warren city government with a recall. That doesn't add up to me. I had to come here and let you guys know. I tried to make a phone call today. The lady that talked to me in the city manager's office wouldn't give me her last name. She said, no, I don't have to give you my last name. I said, well, I'd like to have it so I can tell people who I talk to. She refused to do that. I thought it was very unprofessional. She's spending taxpayer, this guy's spending taxpayers' money as a city attorney that you're paying probably six-figure income to in regards to recalling, as far as I'm concerned, our mayor's doing a great job. And I thought it was wrong. And I think you guys should address this I have, I put my name out today, left my name with this lady. No one from your city has called me back. So I came here tonight on my own to, to voice my opinion. Um, like the lady before, uh, I hope I'm not wasting my breath because a lot of you are looking at me like, uh, you, you know, you don't really know what's going on. But that's what's happening, and I think you guys should address it. These poor people here can't park their cars. Uh, and you got a city attorney who is ripping your city taxpayers off if he's working during the day like this gentleman told me. On his Facebook page, he says he will come by and collect those signatures. That obviously means he's doing it during the day while he's supposed to be working here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Renault. By the way, hey, guys, we don't applaud because sometimes it does intimidate other people that have a um, contrary opinion. So um, let's just make sure we, I have to enforce that with everybody. I know everyone's nice here, but sometimes meetings get out of hand. Um, Mr. Johnson, you wanted to, you had a statement about this. Because by the way, this is our city attorney, Dave Gillum. Um, and this is our city manager, Don Johnson. Don Johnson? Yeah, Mark, Mark Liss is an attorney for the city of Royal Oak. He's also a resident of the city of Warren and a former elected official for the city, and a former elected official for the city of Warren. He was a member of your council. Okay, sir, thank you. You had your three minutes. Uh, as a- Well, I'm just, I'm just he, running into what he said. Sir, yeah, but- No, it's my turn to talk. It's his turn to respond quickly about an employee. Mr. Liss has the same rights that you do or anybody else does to participate in Warren government. He is not doing so on our time. He is not doing so on our time. Oh, yeah, that's what the guy told Sir, you're out of order. Okay, you're out of order. If you pay attention okay. to city government, you know you can't, sir. You're out of order. Okay. Thank you. You can have the last word. That's fine if it makes you feel better. Um, who's next? Yes, sir. Mayor, commissioners, uh, my name is Mike Elias. I'm the CEO of Michigan Pure Med. It's a vertically integrated cannabis operation. We got uh, national and international experience. We've been at it a long time. I uh, started my career in healthcare. I was the chief transformation officer of a 450 bed quaternary facility in Toronto, Canada. I spent a lot of years uh, building service lines around the patient. Um, pretty conservative guy. I actually don't even know how I got into the space, but I've seen a lot of great things going on internationally and in Canada, and I got pulled in uh, to really bring a lean manufacturing approach, uh, patient-centered approach to the work that we do. Um, I guess there's a handful of points here. Uh, one, obviously, we, we favor a very merit-based approach to how the municipalities bring in these operators. Um, there's a lot that can go wrong. Uh, capital is not the, the success factor. Um, Know-how is critical, and uh, we do it with class and execution. And the other piece is um, in not losing sight of the patient. 
in any of the work that we do. Um, so I, I didn't mention, I, I grew up in Southeast Michigan, went to Michigan State, went went to Wayne State School of Medicine, and uh, uh, live in, uh, we got a residence in Harper Woods. I think I was supposed to stay where I live. Um, so I just want to introduce ourselves, and we would be honored um, to help provide you any uh, data-driven information uh, to help guide the decision-making process. Um, talked to Mike, uh, Mayor, and uh, provided my card, uh, so we're happy to help. And we've helped many municipalities and even uh, at the state level here and, and many other states, uh, Ohio, Arizona, uh, those areas. So we're happy to help. Uh, just want to introduce myself. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Elias. Yes, sir. There's not done my time yet until I pass these out. <laughs> My name is Stephen Miller, 115 Georgetown. In 1859, famed author Charles Dickens wrote a story, A Tale of Two Cities. Well, it's 2018, and now we have a real-life tale of two cities. We have Royal Oak elected officials who, for all practical purposes, have given away to private developers several long-used flat surface parking lots scattered throughout the downtown and, at the very same time, have jacked up parking rates everywhere else throughout the city by upwards of 50%. How on earth is this fair? When questioned by the press, an elected official was quoted as saying, quote, well, we have less available parking now, so we need to raise rates everywhere to make more money. Yeah, I thought that was an odd response, too. We have a city, our neighbor to the north, Birmingham, which has the entire downtown main road, Old Woodward, torn up curb to curb since last March, losing all the curbside parking, hundreds and hundreds of spaces. The Birmingham elected officials went the complete opposite direction as the Royal Oak elected officials. Birmingham decided to treat their residents, their taxpayers, their businesses, and their guests with a whole lot more respect. As you can see by the pictures I've handed out, Birmingham elected officials did not gouge everyone by jacking up parking prices when they were faced with the loss of hundreds of curbside parking spaces. No, they opened up several parking decks for free parking all days and all nights each weekend. A very nice, very humble, and very respectful gesture. Speaking about parking issues, I have two more items. First, I see that this mayor and commission majority secretly have gave themselves special parking passes to park free anywhere throughout Royal Oaks downtown, anytime, even when not on city business. Researching this, I cannot find any public vote where this was taken. These free park anywhere, anytime passes were even handed out to other city officials and to friends. I'm wondering, were any of these free passes also handed out to contributors to any of your political campaigns? Again, just wondering. That might make for an interesting FOIA request. I guess I'm just guessing here. Second, come on, for Pete's sake, give the residents of the Royal Oak Manor curbside parking permits around their complex. It would not interfere with anything going on in the downtown area. To me, this seems like a no-brainer. I mean, who could possibly be against this? Several of you elected officials thought that it was a good idea to not allow par permit parking for the seniors of the Royal Oak Manor a few years ago, but instead thought it a good idea to let them pay for long-term parking at a flat lot across Main Street, where these elderly and senior citizens would have to cross four lanes of traffic, the train tracks, with nodal traffic light to protect them. But in the end, I guess none of us should be surprised. The same elected officials who thought it a good idea to have our elderly dodging four lanes of traffic, the train tracks, and no traffic light to protect them, just might be the same elected officials who thought it a good idea to take campaign money from convicted felon Rizzo and the Rizzo Trash Hauling Company. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wolf, you know the rules, okay? Don't make me enforce them, all right, man? Thank you. All right, who's next? In the back, I see a hand. Hi, my name is Kathy Gass, and I live at 402 West Bloomfield. Um, I'm a resident, but I also serve on the Royal Oak Environmental Advisory Board, but I am not speaking on behalf of the board tonight, just for myself. And. Um, I feel kind of out of place here because I should be more complainy. Not that your complaints aren't valid, it's very interesting to hear all the concerns that are going, um, the things that people. Can you speak into the mic? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but this is more of a, um, just kind of an awareness and a compliment um, on the board that I serve 
the entire time we've had great commissioner reps in the past and the present who've always supported the concept of stormwater runoff even before the flood of 2014. It was to maintain the health of and the integrity of our lakes and rivers. So that being said, it's, it's just heartening to know that tonight, some of the things that we've been talking about for years, not one year, not two years, not three years, not four, this has been go an ongoing thing is finally coming to fruition tonight. And I appreciate everyone's efforts. And there were some recommendations that we had made and um, just seeking out those who are more knowledgeable than the members of our board. And some of those have been implemented by Department of Public Works and uh, our service um, engineering and all the other su support departments. So I, I thank everyone here for taking that seriously because I think it's easy to take for granted. Um, we don't live in Flint and some of their issues. Um, I have visited downtown Detroit. It was supposed to be a nice night. I was towed while legally parked. Mm -hmm. And $300 later, and there's not a darn thing we can do about it, a couple months later, I read oh, there was an FBI investigation. So you know, I'm very thankful for where I live and the efforts being made for stormwater management because it's an issue. We will have probably another rain like that in our lifetime. And as far as, I don't think I'm talking to a shoe, <laughs> but not to discount anyone's complaints because everybody here sounds like they have valid concerns and they are, you know, earnestly worried about what's what's going on. But I've never, I haven't, you know, knock on what, I haven't had that experience. And as far as the internet, everybody's a lot braver online. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a whole lot of hostility. So you just have to be able to filter, filter, and filter, and educate yourself. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Guess. And sometimes we get a lot of misinformation at public comment, too. <laughs> Mr. Harrison. Thank you, uh, Bill Harrison, 2729 uh, Trafford. Uh, back in the 70s, I was involved in a joint venture with Black and Veatch on the combined sewer overflow, so I know a little bit what you're talking about. Uh, I, I would like, when you get into this uh, watershed business, I, I'd like a separate meter for my lawn sprinkling system because that's not going to get onto the sewer. Anyway, I'm concerned about the Commission's uh, majority's socialist style of government where you pick winners and <laughs> losers. We all know who the winners are. Boji with free land, five and a half million dollars in cash and a parking structure. Atkin with free land and a parking structure. We see the same attorneys, architect, civil engineer on these projects. But who are the losers? Andy Amos is one. They lost their valet parking and are denied an alternative lot. You go on network TV and badmouth their food. The Astoria uh, retail office building on Main Street where the former bank drive through uh, property was, they were denied parking passes while others are allocated uh, parking passes to other officers. I was going to comment on the senior citizens, but you've uh, done, taken some steps to, to uh, mitigate their uh, problem with the parking passes. And you might talk to OCC. It's about time they pony up and be a better um, better uh, neighbor to the uh, to the downtown uh, downtown retail 70 parking passes were allocated to the office above Buffalo Wild Wings the passes are for the 6th and Main and triangle lot at 6th and Center the 6th and Center lot is critical for retail it would also have been better to allocate passes for the 7th and Main lot and leave the closer parking to the businesses Again, you go on t uh, network TV and agree that Royal Oak does not have enough uh, parking downtown. There's plenty of parking downtown with the new structure until the Boji uh, building comes online. What are these consultants doing to promote downtown during construction? All we've seen so far is a groundbreaking party that was rained out. You put out fake news critical of people who are talking about other restaurants closing. You hire consultants that claim the rents are too high, but are at this podium when I asked about the, what the rents are, they were unable to quote what the rents are. The downtown manager puts out a, a blind questionnaire to find out what tenants are paying for rent, which I support, but there's no measurable. 
such as rent as a percentage of gross sales or gross sales per square foot. I suggest that he put these in, and even when I was on the DDA, I got pushback on asking these questions. These are typical real estate measurable value, uh, values. All of this makes us question whether you and the administration have any idea the hell you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Who's next? I see a hand in the back. Yes. Janice Wagman, 600 Wellesley. A mission statement is a written declaration of an organization's core purpose and focus. The Royal Oak City Commission's mission statement is to provide a safe, healthy, and sustainable community. Speaking of safety, do you believe ROGO is a safe alternative for school buses? Anyone who looks at the routes will see the same buses that service the public also go to the middle and high school on the same routes with basically the same starting time. I would not want fifth graders on the same buses with 11th or 12th graders, and I would not want the smart bus driver to be the monitor. I want a school monitor. If the bus only holds 15 to 30 students, who gets on first? And who has to wait for the next bus? And keep in mind the public is also allowed to use it. <clears throat> and how long will that last student have to wait if there's 35, 40 kids at a stop or along the route that have to get on? Um, who's the last one to get on? How long is it gonna take them to get there? This is not safe. And part of the sustainability in your, in your um, mission statement is the financial state of our community. With regards to ROGO, I don't see a benchmark for pulling the plug on the $15 million plus millage should the revenue generated by fares and the millage not meet the expenses or ridership is so low that it's no longer justified. Although the charter proposal says up to five years, will our contract with SMART allow us to pull the plug or will the city have buses running around with one or two people or less? All paid for with taxpayer dollars. Given the history of both our area and around the country and its inability to support itself, pulling the plug should be a part of that contract with SMART. And I had some things written about Royal Oak Manor, but basically what Pat Perish said was true back in the 70s. People didn't live as long. But the other thing was that the downtown area basically had everything you needed. It doesn't anymore. It's mostly bars, restaurants, a few few shops. Uh, there's no furniture stores. There's no clothing stores like there were before. We had Winkleman's, we had Cresby's, we had Neisner's, we had all that. So we didn't need the cars. The seniors didn't need the cars. They could walk around. Um, so you've got a Band-Aid approach for the next three months. However, during that time period, you've got Arts, Beats, and Eats, and between now and December, you're going to have the spook the spooktacular and a Christmas by the end of the year. And a lot of times, those pay, those same parking lots are used uh, that the seniors use. And without a light there, it's not safe. And safe is part of your mission statement. So again. Your mission is to have a safe, healthy, and sustainable community. Thank you, Ms. Wagman. Who's next? Yes, ma'am. Hi. I'm from the Manor, 606. My name is Constance Peel, P-E-E-L. I just have a question. I know you guys... What a bunch of stuff. I mean, I wouldn't want your job for nothing. But anyway, God bless you. The point is, would it, be, would it make us uh, go bankrupt in town if you did a kind thing for the seniors and just gave them a little green round circle they can put on their thing and let them park free? Just for the seniors. You know, that's, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peel. And I think all of us would want to do that, but there are certain legal issues that we have to consider with that that yeah. take a little bit more creative thought, so to speak. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, 
Well, if you want to yield to the gentleman in the hat, that'd be. Hi, my name is Kalaka Bentley. I have one question uh, concerning the passes. You know, people call you, they say, you better go get your pass. They're running out. Well, okay, I got my August. Cam got my September. So then when I get home, I look at the bottom, and it says, this is not guaranteed that you have a parking spot. What do that mean? Yeah, I think, Mr. Bentley, I'll, I'll just help you real quick since you came here. Um, it means that you can park in that lot, but it's not a private assigned spot in that lot. So well, we, we understand that, but that's not on my office ticket. That's, it's just a ticket like always. This ticket, it has the bottom. So I just, I wanted to know, I'm giving you my $45, so I want to know what's going on. If I'm going to have a parking spot or uh, what? I mean, you know, you would think the same thing, I would imagine. Well, what am I going to do? What, what what's happening because that don't make sense to me sure I, I understand your confusion but that is why we have to i mean you can only sell so many passes a year to ensure that people that buy passes have a spot so um it's not an assigned spot nothing has changed nothing has changed since what we've been doing before okay yes sir My name is uh, Joe Cole Giovanni. I'm at, I have two residents at the moment, but we'll go with 3019 Bamlet. Uh, personal reasons why I have two, but that's my deal. Um, really, I came because I'm a big supporter of what Julie Farhad has done. I lost my brother to a suicide years ago. I'm big on mental health, and I think it's awesome that you guys support it. As some, some of you folks were at the race. I really just was just here to listen to that. And, you know, I just watching you guys and hearing the reaction of the crowd and uh, Mr. Mayor, how you handle it. I just want to commend you guys. Mr. Dubak, you came and spoke at the Woodward side a few times. So I know you guys have, most of you have full-time jobs. This is a very important job, but, you know, I just want to say whether I voted for you, some of you did, some of you didn't, but I appreciate everything you do, and, you know, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Giovanni. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Royal Oak Manor, Ms. Barkoff, I just want to tell you, there's not a senior back here that's looking for a handout and whoever said it should be ashamed of themselves. We are hardworking senior citizens living in Royal Oak Manor, many of us without parking. I thank you for the little work you have done for the parking, but come on. You have how many of you up there and you can't come up with a solution? Thank you, Ms. Carp. All right, Mr. Wolf. Ron Wolf. For 333 North Troy Street. I have a solution, damn it. <laughs> now, the solution is simply is this. In the, uh, in the Old Testament, by the way, it's in the, the part called the Talmud, it says a city's first responsibility to its poor. Yes. Thankfully, we don't have a lot of poor. But we do have a lot of deliveries of Focus Hope to the senior buildings. And these people are hard, hard put to maintain, to keep a car so they can get to their doctors. You know, if seniors can't get to their doctors, what happens? They don't go. If they don't go, what happens? Your, your fire department arrives and takes them away to the hospital. You're not thinking straight. You have about 25 meters surrounding Royal Oak Manor. What is the big deal about bagging them and giving out parking permits to the seniors who will pay for those, gladly pay for those permits, whatever the going rate is in the neighborhoods, instead of being ripped off for $45 and having to risk falling down crossing the street? I was almost killed crossing 11 Mile the other day when a car making a left-hand turn just came right at me. Fortunately, I waved my hands and yelled out, and he, he apologized. But what if he didn't? Well, what, if, what, what if that foot and a half, you know, because he was going at a good rate of speed? And I can tell he wasn't from Royal Oak. Now, these parking permits, uh, they're an abomination. And 
to, to ask these seniors to shell out money that, that they, to keep their last lifeline, their life, the last lifeline they, a senior often has is their car. And what do I get from, when I talk to city officials? Well, uh, they, you know, they, they, a lot of them, they, they go put a chalk mark on their tire. They don't move their cars for 60 days. Or blah, 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 blah. So what, that's their prerogative. You know, it's their parking lot. And, but when they need their car, they need it. And, and I have a car, thankfully, and I, I'm able to keep it. And I offer rides to seniors in my building all the time if they need it. And I take them out and I don't charge them. You know, unless they're, you know, going, if they're going a good distance and, you know, I ask them for a couple of bucks for gas. That's it. But, uh, you know, where, where is your heart? Uh, that's, that's what I'm saying. You know, Mark Liss, God bless him, uh, he wants to get rid of Mayor Fouts. One good thing Mayor Fouts did, he turned down uh, Mr. Bolgi. Now, all I see is gifts and gifts and gifts to the rich and nothing to the seniors. Nothing. You, and by the way, most of you get paid, what, $40 a meeting or whatever? I don't know who's going to chair the senior task force. I presume they're going to get paid Wolf, to I do it. I do need you to finish your thought. Okay, thank Five you seconds. for your time, and uh, I said I hope you can straighten this out and stop wasting money like hot air balloons on thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Hot air balloons, so thousands of dollars. You did mention the senior task force, and I suppose uh, we can get a quick update from our member on the senior task force, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Douglas. Yeah, we've, um, with vacations, uh, we've struggled to get a, a task force meeting together, and I think it's important that the first time we meet, we have all members present. We do now have a date scheduled. It's August 29th at 6 p.m. at the Royal Oak Senior Center. And tomorrow, some of the task force members will be going to a meeting of the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, which are looking at regional issues for um, making Southeast Michigan a more age-friendly community. So even though our meeting isn't until August 29th, we're still doing some research to prepare ourselves for that. Is it 6 or 7? 6 p.m. Okay, yeah. We'll look into that and make sure that's the right time then. Um, and I also, the, the, the crosswalk there has come up a couple different times, and I figure since everybody came out here tonight, we'll break protocol and give you an update on that. Uh, Mr. Johnson, I know you've met with Mr. Ashley, you've met with our city engineers, um, and there is some anticipated um, um, uh, work potentially that's going to be done in that arena. Can you give everyone a, a, a quick... 30 second update on the, the crosswalk? Well, nothing more than what we said at a previous meeting, and that's that we are looking at the, the possibility of putting in a crosswalk there. Uh, it, again, we do have a construction period starting uh, in a few months uh, in that location, we anticipate, uh, at which time we don't want the crosswalk going during the construction. And I also know there's some all, potential railroad uh, construction going on in the fall and potentially into 2019 on that intersection there that can, you know, instead of closing down Main Street 10 times, you know, we have to look for some synergies occasionally to save um, on timing. Mm -hmm. okay. So we don't want you to get the feeling. Yeah, this is the crosswalk at uh, 7th, I believe, right there, or 6th. Yeah, the request was, to, was to do something similar to what we had on 11 Mile before the construction on 11 Mile forced us to take that out. Yeah. So we're not discounting it. We're trying to understand it, and there's a couple things in flux right now. So I know you don't want to hear about long-term solutions, but in the short term, we're trying to balance a couple different things going on in the area. In particular, we have the, the uh, railroad repairs that are crossing my fingers, hopefully coming up. I, we don't always know. And <laughs> they're not the greatest communicators on earth. But actually, um, I'm glad you mentioned the railroad because the crosswalk by the seniors is impacted by the railroad and whatever device we put in there is going to have to be linked into the railroad signals yeah. because we don't want to stop cars and force them to back up onto the railroad tracks. Right. So. A little bit of planning and engineering we got to figure out, but we understand the need. I walk there 
I got to say, in the summertime, almost every single, every other night with my family, okay? So my kids, my five-year-old, my six-year-old, my 10-year-old, my wife, we cross that. That's the first intersection we cross into town. So totally understand what everyone is saying, um, and I experience it myself as well. But, um, you know, just understand we are government, and, uh, you know, um, we do have to worry about a lot of other things that may be going on in the area. So just I'm asking for a little bit of patience on that one. We're trying to do what we can to help you on the parking passes right away, get the medium plan. And on, you're being heard, we understand, and we're working on it, OK? All right, who's next? Anybody that hasn't spoken already tonight? Oh, yes, in the back. I see a hand. I can't see a face. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Janice Hunter. I live at 606 uh, Manor. Uh, I have to have a uh, 24 hour care. This is my kid. I'm her daughter. I'm her daughter. I'm her caregiver. I uh, previously didn't have a vehicle, but now I do. So the issue now is with me having to be there multiple times throughout the day, or if I have to stay overnight with her, I'm not a resident of Royal Oak Manor, which means if being that they don't have a parking chair person, if there isn't a place for me to park, then I can't park. Like now I got the meter the timer running so I can go back down and make sure that I don't get a ticket. But I got another three hours. So my, my issue is like, yes, she, she can't get a parking spot because she doesn't have a car. I have a car, but I need to be there with her frequently. So I've been having to run out at two in the morning and move my vehicle to try to find another spot because there is nowhere for me to park as a guest. When my brother comes, he helps take care of her. There's a 30 minute spot, so he has to be there to do that but if he needs to stay longer if there isn't a spot there's nowhere for him to park which again puts all the pressure on me to just take care of my mother because there's nowhere for him to come to park like now Friday night in Royal Oak Saturday night in Royal Oak I'm like okay I need to be there with her overnight where in the world am I supposed to park this car and then again, I'm out at 2 in the morning. Well, you can park there for midnight. Okay, that's good. I, don't, I can only pay until midnight. But you can't park between 2 and 6 a.m. on this, unless it's on the side of the street of the building. You can park, but there's no spot there available because those people, I noticed, had some sort of parking permit in their window. So they're parked there, which means I'm at 2 in the morning driving around Royal Oak trying to find a place to park so I can be there to take care of my mother. So this, I mean, it's ridiculous me by myself out at 2 in the morning trying to find a spot because now I have to move my car. So, I mean, they're this is an issue you all really need to take care of because it's, it's quite ridiculous for me to be now checking the time again to go and, you know, try to find a meter to make sure I don't get a ticket. Like, I got a, I was able to say, okay, well, you can get a pass because she lives there. So I'm like, okay, so there's a pass for, like, August. But like the other gentleman said, that doesn't guarantee a spot. And then again, you know, it's... And you, it's an issue you really need to resolve so I don't have to be out at 2 in the morning trying to find a place to park my vehicle so I can take care of my mother. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. And I just want to say that, you know, we you need to work with the Royal Oak Manor management as well. I have yet to hear from them as far as how they can help with these situations as well. It is a private building. You know, they do charge rent and they should have visitor parking and they should have, you know, for seniors, a ability to have caretaker parking. So they're part of the solution here, too. We're trying what we can do in fairness to everybody that calls this community home as a city. So understand we hear you. We empathize. But we also need the support of the management at Royal Oak Manor to assist as well. So thank you. I see. Is that Mr. Ashley? I see in the back. Mr. Ashley. My name is Alan Ashley. I live at Royal Oak Manor. Uh, just to inform the commission, I will be at the traffic committee meeting tomorrow. I am helping to close 7th Street. Um, 7th Street has a weird angle that goes on to Main. It's like impossible to see down the street. 
if you're in a car. Plus, you're on top of the sidewalk, and if you have five-year-olds and they see a train, they go nuts. And I'm just worried that if we go out there and a train goes there and the kids are jumping and guys trying to cross and get on the main street from Sevens, some kid is going to get hit. I would like to close at that point, which leaves the section for the railroad so they can have it because that is their property going beyond that statement the, and have the par no parking signs removed so we can have additional parking on 7th Street because we can't park there after midnight. It's no parking from 2 a.m. to 6 and it's never used and that 7th Street is barely used for parking for meters. That would be the first street to be closed down. That is what I'm going to be proposing at the traffic committee tomorrow. I'm also proposing to have two pedestrian lights, one at 7th and one at 6th on Main. That way it's, it's framed so when one goes off, they both go off. That means everybody stops on either side of the tracks. And you're going to need that come construction because you're having an office building built on that small lot next to OCC. That would solve the problem for those people trying to cross to get to the pizza place, which is going to be busier than heck, and the wine place at that store is going to be busy. And all the other little stores that are opening up from that point on down at 555, there's an H&R Blocks coming, there's a, uh, another store uh, for... Uh, women to do exercises that all is going to be used and they're going to need to cross it so i'm going to propose at the traffic to put two one at six and one in maine when one goes off the other goes off and it seals off that street and to have those in the middle of the street not on the sides because in the middle every both lanes of traffic can see it easily and it's you can't miss it today i try to cross it Main Street coming from that parking lot. I stood in the street and watched three cars park with uh, go past me, even with the yellow signs, and they didn't even stop. And they were not going 25 miles an hour. So again, I'm going to be proposing that come tomorrow, and I'm just letting you know ahead of time. And coming for, I got seven, six, and the uh, thing I'll have a proposal to help probably solve some of this parking for Royal Oak Manor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ashley. And those are ideas we can chew on, so thank you very much. Get the piece of clays out there. I trust me, I walk that intersection with my family. I, I hear you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Sandy Smith from Royal Oak Manor, and um, uh, the idea of us uh, parking in the lot across Main Street is not acceptable to me because I would have to move. Um, it's too long of a walk for me, and even if you put up all kinds of lights and this and that, Furthermore, did you, are you aware of the fact that we're being robbed over there? It's very dangerous now. In the last month, two people that I know of, and maybe more, from Royal Oak Manor have been robbed. One um, refuses to make a police report. She doesn't want to get you know, things stirred up. Another one said she will be making a police report. She was in the parking lot at 4 in the morning because she had to get to work. She was robbed. Um, I'm not going to put myself through that. Uh, furthermore, this guy offering to give us spaces in the parking structure in the f future is totally unacceptable. Those parking structures are even more dangerous because people can hide more easily. I've got a friend who used to come into Royal Oak every week to go to the library, Nutra Foods here and there. Now, with the parking situation, she, she's not coming in anymore. She refuses to do business in the city. I said, well, there's a parking structure across from the post office. She said, I will not park in a parking structure. I was robbed in a parking structure, and I will not ever again. 
So, you know, when I moved into Royal Oak Manor, I assumed that I would have reasonable parking. It's, it's just, and now if, if we're forced to park in main, on the main lot, I can't do it. But I don't have the money to get the hell out of the city. So what do I do? I mean, to me, the solution, I, I mean, why can't, I mean, we, we're, we're paying $45 a month anyways. Why can't we have William Street and 6th and 7th designated as permit parking for Royal Oak Manor only? It's safer, it's more convenient. I, I don't get it. When we went through a period of time where um, the meter boys and girls were slamming us with tickets right and left, well, yeah, everybody stopped parking there, but nobody else did either. I mean, nobody in their right mind coming in to, you know, frequent the bars or the restaurants, they want the lot. They want to park in the lot where we're supposed to park. They don't want to cross Main and come into William Street. So it sits empty. You guys aren't making any money. Mr. Smith, I do need you to finish your point. Okay. I, I'm just saying that, you know, the, the only livable so solution for so many of us is getting William Street and 6th and 7th Street okay. designated as permit parking for Royal Oak Manor. Thank you. Thank parking you, in the lot is not acceptable. Chief Donahue? Yes, sir. We didn't have any robberies reported in that. No, I think she even stated they neither of them have been reported to the police, and it's very difficult for us to do anything unless we get these crimes reported. Yeah. No. Okay, who's next? Once, going twice. Yes, ma'am. I am Valerie Locke. I live in the Royal Oak Manor. And I think I discussed last time about the dangers of crossing the street. So, and I did say I would try to videotape how mean the drivers are to everyone trying to get across those tracks with their walkers and their wheelchairs. And it's pathetic. I was a nurse my entire life and it pains me to watch them screaming and yelling at 80 year olds and 90 year olds in the road because they're disgusted with how long it takes for their equipment or for them to get across the road. But I mostly got up here to ask you a question. Um, I am wondering what is going to happen when that building that was built on 7th is inhabited by the Jewish Community Center. There is not one parking spot for them, even in their lot or on the street. I am wondering where these people are going to go when they finally move in that building. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Who's next? Do you know what building she's talking about? Going once, going twice. All right, we're going to bring the meeting back up to this side of the table. I thank everyone for taking the time tonight to speak to the city commission. We do appreciate your comments. All right, that brings us to item number seven, which is the approval of the agenda. Commissioner Macy. Move approval of the agenda. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Macy, supported by Commissioner Douglas. Discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion passes. We have an agenda. That brings us to item number eight, the consent agenda. <clears throat> Mr. Lavasser. I would like item D removed from the consent agenda, please. D? Okay. Anybody else want anything removed from the consent agenda? Okay, so the consent agenda right now is City Commission meeting minutes from July 9th, 2018. Claims July 17th and July 20th of 2018. Approval of purchase orders, award of contract CAP 2011, outdoor fitness equipment and surface project. 
um, grant of easement for stormwater detention facilities, AT&T building project, grant of easement for stormwater detention facilities, public storage, grant of easement for public water main, public storage, 5060 Coolidge Highway, contract modification, contract CAP 1710, contract modification CAP 1715, asphalt resurfacing improvements, Gardenia, award of professional engineering services for surveying 2019 projects, commission for the arts recommendation for approval of the Robert Bruce photography public art application, <laughs> approval of site agreement with Sprint Spectrum for use fire station number two, 31,000 Woodward Avenue, and receive and file non-action items, which consists of park mobile app and meters and dense parking area status report, uh, 2018 revenue and expenditure variance summary report, 2018 second quarter training evaluation forms, and Moody's Investor Services annual comments. Is there a motion? to approve the consent agenda as read. Commissioner Douglas. So moved. A motion by Commissioner Douglas. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Dubuck. Any discussion? With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Consent agenda is passed, which with the exception of item D, Commissioner Lavasser. I want to make sure I understand this. If I'm understanding this correctly, uh, this is a proposed amendment to the contract with uh, Noah and Frost involving the Normandy Oaks to add in uh, community engagement with regard to the downtown town park as well. Is that an accurate? With the initial RFP for Normandy Oaks and the downtown park, it was all part of the same RFP, but it's really two separate processes, and there was a separate fee identified in that contract for the downtown park during the discussions of the ta two task force meetings, since it was rather nebulous when we did the RFP for the downtown park community engagement, we had the two meetings and the scope uh, expanded beyond what the initial concept was for the down, what was expected for community engagement. Let me just make sure I understand. We, we did do an RFP for the community engagement for, for both We parts. did. Thank you. Commissioner Pruch. Um, as chair of the downtown task force, I can add a little bit more information. When the original RFP went out for both parks, uh, the amount that was allocated within the proposal uh, by Noah and Cross was, was relatively small because it, it was so many years ago at the beginning of this scope of the project that um, really no one really envisioned the type of community engagement that we were going to need or going to want. Um, since then, we have had the Normandy Oaks public engagement process, which was a very expansive, um, uh, time-consuming, and intense uh, form of public engagement in order to put together that plan. What this proposal in front of you tonight is intended to do is duplicate that same process for the downtown park that we had for Normandy Oaks. And the original dollar amount that was in the Nowak and Frouse pr original proposal nowhere near covers it. So what we're trying to do is duplicate the same kind of public um, uh, engagement process for this park as we did for Normandy Oaks. And, and the original scope of the proposal just didn't envision that because we hadn't done the Normandy Oaks one yet. We just had no concept of what we wanted to do. Now we do know what works and we want to be able to duplicate it. So this, the scope of types of meetings and community engagement activities that are listed here and itemized for dollar amounts is fairly close to what happened at Normandy Oaks. Um, and that's why it's here. Thank you, Commissioner Bruce, for those insights. Is there a motion or any discussion? Commissioner Proust. I'll move approval of this. Motion by Commissioner Proust, second by Commissioner Newbuck. Discussion? With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right, we'll have an equally exciting and publicly engaged plan for uh, the downtown park. Um, all right, that brings us to item number nine, which is the public hearing to vacate public easements, Royal Oak City Center project. I sense Mr. Twing is behind me. And I'm right. Senses are correct. 
Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of the commission. Um, the commission did set tonight uh, for a public hearing on easements uh, as part of the Royal Oak Civic Center project. Uh, you'll see in your packet the actual descriptions and the location survey map uh, attached to your commission letter. Uh, very briefly, those easements are along the west side of the 11-mile uh, parking deck, uh, along the west side of the office building, and along the north side of the office building. Um, they need to be vacated in order for those structures to be placed uh, uh, at their planned location. Uh, so part of the charter process is for you to hold a public hearing before proceeding with the uh, vacation. Do we have any questions for Mr. Twing? Okay, with none, I'll open up the public hearing. So same rules apply as they did for public comment. Is there anyone here to speak on this vacation this evening? <clears throat> okay, I'll close the public hearing. Discussion, motions, questions? Commissioner Douglas. Um, I will move approval of the motion as submitted. A motion by Commissioner Douglas. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Perouche. Discussion? With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Okay. Motion passes. This brings us to item number 10, public hearing to vacate rights of way for New City Hall. Mr. Uh, very similarly, um, tonight's been scheduled for a public hearing on uh, easements as well as rights of way uh, in the farmer's market uh, courthouse uh, proposed city hall area. Uh, very brief description, uh, you'll see an aerial uh, with the outline of, of those easements. A uh, portion of Hamilton Court, a portion of 2nd Street, and then two, two adjacent public alleys uh, in that area. Again, part of the purpose in vacating uh, these rights of way are twofold. Uh, the City Hall building would encroach or cover a portion of those rights of way and you can't build a building across the property line. The second reason for doing this would be to combine some seven parcels uh, that are in the uh, area of the farmer's market, courthouse, uh, proposed city hall into a single parcel after these rights of ways have been uh, vacated. And again, the charter requires the public hearing. Questions for Mr. Twing? Okay, we'll open up the public hearing. Same rules apply as a uh, public comment. I've probably said that four times, I apologize, but I'm required to say it. Uh, anybody here to speak on this vacation tonight? Okay, we'll close the public hearing, bring the meeting back up to here. Um, Commissioner Perouche? I'll move approval of the resolution to vacate all of these. The motion by Commissioner Perouche, second by Commissioner Macy. Discussion. Commissioner Perouche. When you look at the diagram, it's clear that all of these areas right now are existing public parking, both for the farmer's market and I think perhaps part of this for the district court as well. And even if we weren't building City Hall or weren't doing any improvements at all on this lot, it makes sense from a property law perspective to clean this up so that it, it all is on a unified parcel. Um, most of it will end up being parking, so nothing is going to get built on it. I think maybe the City Hall might include a little bit on one of these but uh, just for ease of our future people who are dealing with our property um, that we hold as a city our property holdings it makes sense just to clean this up because uh, it, it makes no sense whatsoever to have them these individual little pieces of land here and there um, the part that used to be a dedicated street and it's not anymore and alleys and so on that aren't there it's all it's all parking right now so it makes sense to clean it up Thank you, Commissioner Perouche. Any other discussion? All right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Nay. Motion passes. All right, this brings us to item number 11, parking plan for Royal Oak Manor, uh, an item that we kind of already pre-discussed. Um, Mr. Johnson, just to kind of recap. Um, As I said before, this was a non-action item. There's no, no resolution provided. And we have covered the report completely already, so I don't really have anything to add. 
if, Mr. if I may, um, I believe that Pete Stuffy, the manager for C, uh, the, C, the CS, CSI representative for Royal Oak Manor is in the back and maybe we could give him a short opportunity to speak. He probably was not aware that he should have spoke at public comment. Well, I have to open that up to the commission if they want to open up special public comment. Is, is that a motion by Commissioner Gibbs? I can make that a motion, yes. Second. Second, okay. Um, discussion? Call for the vote. All those in favor, aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, come on up. Um, thank you. I apologize that I didn't know I was supposed to speak during public comment, but uh, I just wanted to introduce myself and read a statement from CSI, the management company for Royal Oak Manor. <clears throat> Uh, CSI Support and Development is a nonprofit, resident member controlled organization that utilizes a cooperative management system and engages its resident membership in decision making at every level of its operations at its 59 locations. For over 50 years, as a mission driven nonprofit, CSI exists solely to provide the highest quality, affordable housing communities possible for seniors. Royal Oak Manor was, co op was constructed in 1973 as a 240 unit, partially subsidized HUD Section 236 affordable senior apartment building. The Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, required that the co op be built with 70 parking spaces, which met the, the driving needs for seniors in the early 1970s. HUD would not fund the development with additional parking spaces beyond the initial 70 spaces on the property. Over the years, the number of driving seniors increased substantially. To meet the needs of this trend, CSI obtained HUD approval for Royal Oak Manor to purchase a plot of land across the street to accommodate an additional 38 parking spots for the residents. In addition, the city of Royal Oak agreed to provide 20 parking passes from 2004 until 2012 for Royal Oak Manor residents to park on the street surrounding the building. As a result of the city's terminating of the 20 passes, Royal Oak Manor purchased passes across Main Street for the residents through their HUD-approved operating budget. Unfortunately, HUD no longer allows this, so, Rene so Royal Oak Manor cannot purchase the extra spaces, and this financial res responsibility now falls on the residents, many of whom live on fixed incomes. Currently, Royal Oak Manor Co-op owns a total of 108 parking spaces for its residents. There are about 30 residents who buy par uh, parking passes from the city. The recent increase in the price of these passes from $25 a month to $45 a month, along with the reduction of the number of passes being sold by the city, has put these residents in a difficult situation. Royal Oak Manor is located in an urban setting where parking is at a premium. As the city continues to grow, permanent parking spaces for residents are more difficult to obtain. The options available to Royal Oak Manor Co-op are limited by HUD budget approval, which will not allow for the purchase of additional parking. As the management company for Royal Oak Manor Co-op CSI Support and Development is grateful that the city of Royal Oak is working to address the shortage of parking. As the city changes and development expands in the area around the building, it is vitally important to our residents to have access to safe, reason reasonably priced parking within close walk walking distance of the building. CSI Support and Development would be happy to work with the city on this issue. Um, to, request, to request a meeting with CSI Support and Development or for more information on this matter, please contact the Co-op Liaison Property Manager, Pete Steffi, at the contact info above. So I've got my contact information on here, and as I said, we, we really appreciate um, you know, what, what you've done to help uh, try, to, try to remedy this issue, and uh, you, know, you have my information if you would like to talk with us more. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steffi. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Steffi? Sorry to put you on the spot. I know it was just uh, public comment, but I don't see any questions. Um, I will say we we got some ideas. You heard about some at public comment, and uh, we really appreciate you extending an offer to, to support and, and help because I think we all understand the difficult situation uh, that uh, that parking uh, can can play for um, the residents of Royal Oak Manor, and we just need all hands on deck to, to help find the best solution. Commissioner Dubuc. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks for your statement, and I think we've demonstrated that we want to help resolve this problem for, for the residents of Royal Oak Manor. Uh, I'm curious though about uh, you know procedures on your end. So the the parking that you do on that's right adjacent to the building, how is that distributed? We we have a waiting list for that. So, so it's just based on seniority, not on need. Right. Well, we have we have a, a policy for um, reasonable accommodations where where people, if you know, if they have a verified medical need, can can basically jump the wait list. Um, okay. So people with severe mobility impairments should be able to get priority exactly. in that yeah. lot. 
Yeah. Okay. And what about, we heard about uh, caregivers this evening. Do you have reserve spaces for visitors or caregivers or permanent caregivers? We do not, no. We, um, unfortunately, you know, because of the na nature of the limited limited parking at Royal Oak Manor, we don't have any reserve spots for visitors, which we, we have at many of our other co-ops, but just because the parking is so limited there, we, we really need them need them all for the um, for the members of the building. I think we've opened up a good dialogue, and I'd like to be a part of any meeting that you have with the city leadership to uh, help remedy this problem. Thank you. Commissioner Perush? This may, this may not work out at all, and so I don't want anybody to get their hopes up, but is there any possibility that block grant funds could be used in some way to, because we're dealing with a low-income population to some degree, maybe you've already took a, taken a look at that, just to provide some additional funding for whatever. Um, I don't know, if somebody has taken a look at it, then never mind, but if, if we haven't taken a look at it, I think it might be worth a, a quick look to see whether or not um, we might be able to some leverage, maybe able to some leverage some funds out of the block grant funds, which are HUD funds. That's a great. That's a great thought. I'll, Commissioner Dubuck, I know he has more expertise in this area than uh, I do. I'm, I think it's worth worth asking the question. Although I did know right after you raised the issue that you said that their HUD funds they used to pay for the them during their through their HUD funds, and now that's a disallowed purpose. But sir, perhaps CDBG is governed differently than yeah, the, the funds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, HUD has a whole umbrella full of you know programs right. and so on and so forth. So it, it's possible. It's I, as I say, it's not. You know, we don't want to hold our breath waiting for it. But on the other hand, it, it might be something. We're looking at. Let's put it on the list to look at and get a get an understanding to because that's a that's a that's a that could be a really good tool. Yeah. Help solve some of the issues that we may have with you know rates and things like that. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other Commissioner Lavasser? Uh, I'd like to get a little bit of the history with regard to the uh, twenty st street parking passes that uh, the city used to provide and no longer does, and, and what and what was the reason for the change? I'd have to do research to, to remember the exact reason, but I know it was a request made by the DDA, the city's parking committee. Uh, I think it was at the time the meters were put on the streets uh, in that area, and the city commission agreed. Okay, uh, do you need a motion to, to look into it, or? All right. I'll be happy to look into it. Well, one thing I noted when, when I looked at the area, I, I saw that there was, uh, six meters on 6th Street, six meters on William Street, four on 7th. There was actually four meters on Main Street right adjacent to Royal Oak Manor. So that right there is... Those are used for public because most of our members right. can't park, negotiate yeah. that area. I, I understood. But but that's 20, air, tw 20 meters right there, and cer certainly those would be better than across the street. Uh, with regard to that area on 7th that you may look to close. I'm not sure how many cars that might accommodate, but that, that, I wasn't even thinking about that when I drove the area. But uh, certainly would, would like to see some solutions, and that, you know, that area would seem to be the most logical area to look for there, solutions. There's meters all on 7th Street, and they're all um, very seldom used. The only problem we're going to have is when that Jewish Community Center opened up because it was built with no parking. And I have no idea how anybody let them build a building with no parking. Because the next to them is a recording studio. And that park is used all night long at times across uh, from us. So I don't know, are they going to bust them in? I have no idea what's going to happen. But I know that if we have 7th Street and that parking from 2 to 6 a.m., if we can get those all those signs removed, that will alleviate some of the problem of caregivers coming in and, and I'm worrying about after midnight or after 11 o'clock. That can be used and also make 7th Street a safer street by having it closed off. That is what I'm hoping for tomorrow. I also add too, we got to be conscious about the meters as well because where do your visitors park? When you have family come in and whatnot, you got to have at least some spots yes. perhaps. We have very little because we have so many people that can't cross Main Street. Are you parking now on Williams and what little we can on 6 because once you get past Williams, the uh, fire department has 6th Street. 
So we're kind of trapped. Yeah, what I'm hearing, I mean, we understand the issues, and we're hearing some good ideas. And I don't want to turn this into a brainstorming session because we've got a lot of other folks that have city business here tonight. But I appreciate um, Mr. Steffi coming here and, uh, and talking to us, and, and I think that between the residents, uh, between our city commission, between your management staff. I think we can put together our best experiences and our best ideas together, you know, to try to crack this nut. So, um, you know, we look forward to that. And, and Commissioner Newbuck has volunteered to get personally involved, which I think is great because he has, um, I think, some really good experience given his past history dealing with a lot of ADA issues and things of that nature. I think he brings a tremendous amount of wisdom. And he, he I know he's equally passionate about making sure we solve this. So um, we appreciate your time. And thanks for uh, speaking tonight. Thank you very much. I look forward to working with you. Thank you. All right, so City Manager Donald Johnson, you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Commissioner Gibbs? I, if we're finished with that item, I have a question related to parking meters. Were we not supposed to revisit the parking increases today, the parking meter increases today? The update's on the agenda. Oh, it is? Is it? Where is it? Why did I not? Oh, you're right. Never mind. I take that back. All right. Well, that brings us to item number 12. Wait, before that, can I say something? Um, All right, Mr. Ash, I'll give you one more minute. You've been very good with your good ideas. Since you've given so many good ideas, I'll give you a couple seconds Here's here. Here's my proposal to the commission. There is an empty parking lot at... Six in Williams across from the fire department. There has been more for sale and lease signs on that parking lot. My proposal is, if it's possible, is that the city buy that lot, tear down the building on it, which would probably give us close to 40, maybe 45 parking spaces in that parking spot. We will pay $35 a month for parking there so all our members now are can park there. We are no longer across the street. We've got 40 spots. We will pay back it by paying the $35. That gives you not only money from that lot, but also the meters that we are now taking up where you're not getting anything. That is my proposal to put a, th a think tank on. An empty lot that's been blank for two and a half years. Nope. More for sale and lease signs have been on that thing than I can count. It's not being used. If the city knows who bought it, who isn't buying it, who's selling it, if the city through a grant can buy that lot, fix it up, fence, us, fence it in, and let us have an opening to get in and out of the parking lot to the sidewalk, we would be paying $35 for that each person to park there would go to the city to pay you back for for building that parking lot. That's another good idea. So we'll have Thank to take a much. look at that one, Mr. Ashley. How, how many spots was that? Uh, I'm estimating approximately 40 to 45 once that building is down, because there is a small building on that lot. Okay. It's a long lot. It goes almost uh, three quarters of 6th Street from Williams. I know the fire department sometimes uses part of that for parking some of their people, but I think we can share, there's enough for us to share at this time. But this is a temporary, because uh, this will give us 40 spots that we need badly now. Thank you, Mr. Ashley. Thank you. All right, now, the presentation. <laughs> the Friends of Mark Twain Dog Park, all right. Thank you for your patience. I'm Ann Gardner. I live at 4502 Briarwood. Sarah Kininger, 1000 North Blair. We are here uh, to present a master plan for Mark Twain Dog Park. We're here as the Friends of Mark Twain Dog Park Committee to be recognized in, as an independent entity working on behalf of the dog park. And if, uh, if it's possible, we'd like to present it present you with our hard copy of our master plan. 
Our mission is to improve the conditions of the park and organizing the membership and fundraising and volunteer events. On behalf of the park, we would like to present our master plan, and I would just like to take a few short minutes to explain to you why we think Mark Twain Dog Park needs an oversight committee and uh, some of the challenges that face the park today. As it states in Parks and Rec Master Plan on page 29, development of new volunteer-based partnerships and programs was discussed to reduce costs for the department while increasing the level of community involvement and resident ownership of community spaces. We are here as volunteer partners. We are not here to point fingers. We are not here to place blame. We are here to work with Parks and Rec and also the city to help assist in maintenance and also improve this park. So uh, a couple of months ago, we started to meet as members, as a group, to discuss some of the problems of Mark Twain, uh, mostly because the pet waste was not being picked up. So uh, after those meetings, uh, we went to social media. And uh, after some postings on Facebook on three Royal Oak sites, I learned three things. Many people didn't know Mark Twain Park existed. Number two, some commented that they would not pay for the park because of the condition it was in. And number three, Royal Oak residents were saying that they were taking their dogs to other parks in Ferndale, Troy, and uh, Lake Orion. So we've had about 50 new members since April. And a lot of these members are young people in their 20s and 30s who have moved to Royal Oak in the apartments, condos, and the brand new homes with small yards. And they're really excited to promote Mark Twain Dog Park. One of the members, Andrew Warner, showed me a Snapchat filter that he designed himself for Mark Twain Dog Park. And he works in the media and offered to shoot professional video for us to put on our website to share. So we are really interested in promoting our social media awareness through the millennials that are joining the park. Never ever do we want brand new residents of Royal Oak, let alone members of the dog park, to walk in to see this. And this is part of uh, what's on your master plan. This is one of the pictures that I posted after waste had not been picked up for three weeks at Mark Twain Dog Park. I watched members of the park take this waste out after I took the picture, drug it out to the barrel. Over the winter, I myself found a dead rat after the snow thawed because the waste on the south side of the park had not been picked up for so long. I removed that waste myself. So we would like to ask at this time whether or not there is a contract with Pet Butler, the waste removal company, and if there is or if there isn't, we as a committee would like to work with Parks and Rec to solve the problems of the broken waste baskets, to solve the problem of the waste not being picked up for weeks at a time, or to possibly find a brand new company to work with. So members have always taken pride in the park. And by doing that, we put a fence around smaller trees to help save them from the dogs. Two of the members had to place boards and spikes on the fence because it had come loose from the ground. Now, normally at other parks, this is not an issue. You know, some loose fencing. Their dog got out underneath this fencing and ran out into Campbell. So something as, you know, some loose fencing can turn an awesome day at the dog park into a day of tragedy of losing your pet. It's little things like this that the members see every single day that we've taken upon ourselves to fix because obviously we don't want anything to happen to our pets. But also, you know, we want to maintain that park and keep it safe for everyone. The one thing that we cannot fix is the back gate. So currently there are two ways into Mark Twain Dog Park. You have to use a fob to get in the front gate and the back gate. The back gate has been broken for so long, they actually placed a sign on the front gate saying it was out of commission. And you also have that picture of that sign in your packet. So some people have taken upon themselves to walk through the back gate. 
which causes a lot of tension between the paying members of Mark Twain and the non-paying members of Mark Twain. And that has caused some harsh words on some days, but it has not stopped them. So you have knowledge of people coming in the back gate through the sign that has been put on the front, people who have not paid and people who have not proven that their pets are vaccinated, this is negligence. But we feel that we have come up with a solution because in the words of Park and Rex, this has been an ongoing problem. And it has been for years, three years, as far as we know, that the gate has not worked. So we're aware that there is an apartment complex that's being built on the north side of the park, 186 units. And we've been told that they are going to be pet friendly. We welcome this. We welcome brand new members. We want to be good neighbors to Midtown Point, even though they are taking away three fourths of our wooded area. A lot of people are totally unaware that this wooded area contains pass, benches, birdhouses that the scouts put in. That that park or that wooded area is walked a lot by the members and by citizens who aren't members who come across the street just to walk in there. So even though they're taking away three fourths of our woods, we'd like to invite Gleason to give us their wood chips so we can build up our pass. This will save them money. But also we're concerned because even though a lot of people don't know that those woods contain uh, walkways, who does know are the students of Bishop Foley. <laughs> Their school is fenced, you know, on the south side. They had a residential gate that has been broken twice. The lock has been broken because the students like to hang out in the woods during school. It was broken so many times and they had such a problem. This May, Bishop Foley put in a commercial style gate and padlocked it. The students actually built a fire pit back there at some point. This is how often they were using those woods. It's totally secluded. So having experienced this before, the members are concerned. We're concerned that the residents of Midtown, um, Midtown Point will feel free to use what's left of those woods and it'll be very tempting for children. And what none of us want is a small child to encounter a 80 pound running golden retriever because that's what that is. It is a dog run and that's what those dogs do. So what we would like to see is, we would like to see a six foot fence, chain link fence put from the uh, corner of the park and run all the way back to the fence. Those businesses back there are all fenced off. Bishop Foley is all fenced off. This will keep that park area secure and safe. There are many single women, including myself, that walk our dogs back there and we're concerned. We're concerned for our safety if that is left entirely open on that side. So this is consistent. A six foot fence is consistent with what the nature centers have. It would solve the problem of the back gate. You would never have to deal with it again because uh, the only way in and out would be through that front gate. And that has been working and it beautiful job of fencing and it's all brand new. So you know, we feel that the gate is, solves a lot of, that fence solves a lot of problems for all of us. We, the committee, want to build relationships with pet friendly businesses to get their products to the people who use them, the dog owners. We want to fundraise for not only improvements to the park, but also for excellent causes like the Royal Oak Animal Shelter. This summer, we've had a bench delivered, donated by a resident. It's our fourth. We had two from the Boy Scouts. In closing, we never want a Royal Oak resident to go to another city to use their dog park, let alone touted all over social media. We want to help the city make Mark Twain Dog Park into something that you are proud of. So proud you use it as a selling point to our many new young residents, the millennials. As someone once said, we've achieved this together because we're in this together. We've achieved this together because we can stay together. Mayor, <laughs> please recognize 
recognize us as the independent entity responsible for Mark Twain Dog Park to work in partnership with Parks and Rec of Royal Oak. Thank you so much for your time. Are there any questions? Thank you. Commissioner Gibbs? Not necessarily a question. I, I've spoken with both of you, and thank you very much. I was also given a, a grand tour on a 1,010 degree day <laughs> um, where we almost melted. But the dogs were fine, and there was water. It, it was great. Um, the park is in poor condition. The fence just blew my mind that they have taken wood and shoved it under the fence because it's all bent up and animals get in, animals get out, dogs get in, dogs get out, raccoons, whatever. Um, I did want to let you know that on July 5th, I spoke with Greg Russell from DPW about the pet butler issue, and I'd also spoken with Julie Rudd about the payments that had been made to them. And I provided on July 5th um, three, I don't have a dog, but for what I've heard from others that are reputable places that are local. So um, I hope that Mr. Russell, now he's been on vacation for about a week, right? He was back earlier. He's back, okay. Um, but I hope that that is being attended to. So I will keep you updated on that. But thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? So just to be clear, there's the fence, what appears to be a fence on the north side, doesn't go all the way through the woods? No. Okay. And, and there is a fence on the back side, but the gate is broken? Or no, the, the fob um, doesn't work? It yes. Works. The, okay. The, if you're looking at the picture on page five of the appendix, the, the fence kind of comes right in front of the trees. The tree yeah, area I, looks much larger than it act, on this picture for some reason than it actually yeah, is. Yeah, got it on, on yeah. Google Maps here. Okay, perfect. And just out of curiosity, why would there have been a gate in the back to begin with? That's our access to those walks, uh, to the uh, wooded area in the back, the dog run. Actually, the two acres of wooded area behind the fence belongs to Mark Twain Dog Park. And there are signs that say dog run. And yeah, so, so Commissioner Douglas, the park is really broken up into two areas, the open field type area. Right. And then you go through the back gate and you can access the wooded trail area where dogs can run and have fun and kind of have a more that is forestry a, experience. It has three sides are fenced, but the fourth side is not enclosed currently. And that's the what east side, the north side. The north side. North so side. The, the south side is fenced because of Bishop Foley. Foley. The east side has a fence. Right. Um, and then the back is because of the business is in Madison Heights, so there's one exposed area of the north. strip to go across mm -hmm. the north. Yeah, we just right. need one, I think it's about, um, I can't remember, how much was it? 750. 750 chain length to completely enclose the rest of the wooded area, so then all seven acres would be fenced off. Okay, good, Th thank you. You're You'd only need one gate then because... Yes, right. right, so then we would just come in through the front. You could still use that to access the wooded trails because not all the dogs want to go back right. there, but we wouldn't need it to be secure in any longer. have to keep up on it. You yep. still keep separation exactly. for the two different areas. Yep. Yeah. Commissioner Dubuck. Thank you for this. This is really, really helpful. And Agreed. I think a, a model of how we want to be collaborating <laughs> with residents who want to you know, make things even better in our city. So thanks for bringing this forward this way. Um, so if I'm understanding, you're asking us to establish um, your, your board as an official city board with the, the responsibility of overseeing the park and working with city staff regarding Mark yes. Dog Park. Yes. Is that what you're, that's what you're asking for, is that it be recognized as a city entity? Yes. So the governance then, you know, I just want to understand your vision of it. Generally, all city boards then are subject to appointment by the city commission or, or appointment by the mayor with approval by the city commission. Uh, right now, you're a board of people who have opted in because you care about the park. Right. Um, I guess, how would that work with your vision of, of how the board would operate? Because generally, if, if it's a city board, we form an ordinance, establish it by ordinance, and then there is city oversight of, of who sits on the board. Well, Nature Society has a really good model for um, a group of volunteers who work to oversee the nature, uh, you know, nature centers. And we spoke to Bob Mueller and asked him what he thought, you know, and we kind of looked at their master plan and we um, kind of mirrored their, you know, their model. You know, 
know, where they work with the city, but they oversee the nature center. They do the fundraising and all that. And so that's what we wanted to do. But we wanted to build something. Rome uh, started uh, Mark Twain Dog Park, uh, Royal Oak Animal Mission, back in 2009. But the board kind of fell apart, you know, due to, you know, dogs dying, people moving, not re not coming back. We Our vision is to build something that is there always that as we leave someone comes in and takes our place so that there is always someone who is looking after the park mm -hmm. you know so as we move on someone who is in their 20s and 30s you know who's been there for a while can step in you know and say hey you know the fence is broken we have brand new tree we need fencing around it you know this needs done or that and we really would like to beautify that wooded area in the back you know there's so many trees down and over the pass and I mean it's it's a mess back there but you know we and we want to get back there with volunteers to do that but if the apartments move in and it's kind of overrun with non-members I don't know how we're going to get volunteers yeah. to do that you know so I this is we're kind of coming to you and saying you know, let us help. Yep. Let us know how we can help. We have seven people who are committed to being um, part of a board, part of this commission, whatever, however you want to call it. We're willing to volunteer our time. You can see how hard, you know, we've worked on this master plan. We've had hours of meetings. We've met with the membership. It's growing. It is going to continue to grow, especially with these young people coming in and saying, hey, I want to put on Snapchat. I want to go to social media. The more we let people know about this park, the more people are going to come. You know, so we want to make sure it's the best it possibly can be. So I'm convinced, I mean, just in my opinion, that I don't think there's anyone better out suited to manage the needs, know the needs of Mark Twain Dog Park than those who are using it. Right? I mean, I'm convinced. I think the idea of a city board is one option. I would also, I mean, with that comes a whole heck of a lot of work and scrutiny, open meetings acts, publishing of minutes, all of this. Um, there may be other options at our disposal list too, as well, where, you know, you can, you know, form a board independently. It might take a little bit of, um, you know, small amount of effort on your end to get it organized, have bylaws and all of that. And, you know, yeah, maybe- we actually do have some proposal of bylaws that we've already established. Okay, that, perfect. Um, we, were work, we were working through and we just didn't have time to finish right, them. Right, right. We wanted to come here, get on the agenda, and then we would go back and actually work through what those bylaws, bylaws look like. But a draft of them is also in your packet of what we kind of thought from an establishment and, of how we would- operate. And that might give you a little bit more um, because, I mean, look, the people that are using the park are the ones spending the money to be at the park that, you know, can vote and govern themselves. And, I mean, we as a city are committed to having a dog park. So, um, you know, I think there's a uh, – what I'm doing is I'm, I'm saying, like, there's a, there's a couple different ways we can approach this, but I'm convinced that you guys are best suited to help um, – you know, make sure that the needs are being met there. Uh, and um, I, I really appreciate the proposal. Um, very well thought out. A lot of great ideas here. And I think you are thinking of solutions. You're not just coming up and saying, oh, I need this, I need that, give me money, whatever. It's, hey, you know, we're all members of this community. Let's figure out how to, you know, what's best. So, um, uh, before we go to, to any additional comment, I know uh, City Manager Don Johnson has a few comments. Just one. Uh, the model of the Nature Society might be a good model for you, but yeah. I would point out the Nature Society is independent. It is not part of the City of Royal Oak. Right. Okay. So maybe what we would do then, I think, could we potentially have a seat on the par Parks and Rock as a advisory board to help consult for this park, to be that representative of this park? And I'm not asking for a voting seat. I'm asking for just a, an opportunity to sit with that group, potentially, and have conversations. Is that a better way to go about it than we maintain our independence? Well, if you aren't looking for a voting seat, those meetings are open meetings, and you're, okay. every member yeah. of your group can attend those okay. meetings. I don't know how feasible it is to get a voting seat on that board. I mean, certainly it's an option. I don't. We're really looking to try to figure out what makes sense, and I think the independence is something we would probably, I'm not well, sure we do want to go to that full city. 
Yes. Yeah, I don't know if that's the best. I mean, it, it is a route, but you know, I think that it that might not be necessary for the goals and ambitions that you have, and for what's necessary to to make that the best dog park in Michigan. Hmm. That should be our goal. We strive for excellence. I do know that Bob Mueller does have a voting seat at the Parks and Rec. I don't know if he. No, he does not. No. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Thank you for interrupting. Okay. Bob Mueller does not have, have a voting seat on the board. They operate as an independent board, and they work closely with staff in supporting their fundraising activities. They do an annual report that they send out. I think most of the commissioners have seen it, mm -hmm. a summary of the activities they've done. They also do a quarterly newsletter that they mail out to the commissioners. I think you usually get a copy of it. I know it's also online on their Facebook page or, or, or whatever. I'm sorry for speaking. No, that's, that's quite all right, and I'll be glad to work with you. I, I think I met with you a few months ago. Uh, I have not heard from you since the last Park and Rec Board meeting that people showed up at. I think it was in June. So I have had no contact with you since then. So some of the issues, uh, you know, if there's a problem with trash or anything like that, you, you have my number, give me a call, and we will get it addressed. And let's know that Parks and Rec does take a summer off. So they, yeah. there isn't a meeting until summer. Right, right. So, <laughs> you know, I'm almost, I mean, for next steps, I think we have some meat here to work with. I think we have, I mean, I don't know what the other commissioners feel like, but I'm sensing that we need to have something um, with management, with somebody from your board, and maybe someone from our Parks and Rec board. Uh, Melanie Macy is the uh, commissioner uh, sitting on that board. Um, you know, to come up with a with a formal pitch. I mean, this is a great report, but sure. you know, reports got to translate into action, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's where my head's at. Commissioner Pruish, I know, has probably some better ideas, but. Well. Not necessarily better than theirs, because theirs are fabulous, but <laughs> I want to ask Mr. Russell, do you know if the Nature Society is a 501c3? Are they a, a registered nonprofit? I believe they are. They were did most of their fundraising and ran it through the former Roots program that the city ran. That was what they used as their bank account for their fundraising and how they do the, did their withdrawals. And that was, as a matter of fact, the previous generation of this room, that is how they raised the money for the fencing and it was through that roots process that the money was withdrawn to pay for the fencing. We okay. did a search, and they are not a 5013C. If they, we asked Bob Mueller, he's, they are not a 5013C. And they are not. No. I know. I think all their money went into the, the roots. roots. Yeah, and they were able to withdraw it. And, and put it in. Right. And take it out at the and, first and, roots, yeah. And that's another issue, because there is money earmarked for Mark Twain Dog Park that we would like to use for improvements. Sure. I have a follow-up. Just comment. Sure. Um, if I were you, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with a formal organization under the city umbrella. It's too complicated. There's too many rules. It's too restrictive. And you guys can do your own thing a whole lot better. However, it's interesting that the Nature Society is not a 501c3, but that's something, some type of organization like that, you might consider just for your own liability protection, just for, because you, you want to protect yourselves um, and you want to be able to do the work that you are doing without having to fiddle with any of those issues. So um, I can defer to our, Brad, what were we looking to do? Oh. We were looking to set something up after this meeting. Right. Okay. okay, we are going down that path. Just okay. appreciate Perfect. that. Just want to check with our yeah. attorney. Yeah, and it may check <laughs> with our attorney to make sure I'm speaking correctly. <laughs> Well, this attorney kind of yes. thinks that you may not want that kind of an umbrella organization either. But on the other hand, um, I would think that you would want something formally so that you would feel um, protected in what you're doing. That's, Thank you. That's my point. I appreciate your advice. Thank, Thank you. you. I look forward to a Royal Oak, or to a Mark Twain dog park fundraiser. Okay. <laughs> and I don't even have a dog. <laughs> you can borrow one of ours. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be happy to come to me. Yes. Commissioner Dubuck. So yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, Mr. Johnson hasn't said on, on where we would go next with this, and, and you know, so you're establishing your organization. I think we want to work closely in partnership with you. So how? I mean, clearly you can, you all can pick some of the liaise uh, regularly with Parks and Rec when they are meeting, and so you would just send your liaise on there to give them updates on, on what's happening at the park and perhaps what the park needs from a Parks and Rec point of view. But as far as informing, uh, you know, the department or city staff, uh, what kind of relationship would we form? 
um, that, that would be similar to what we have well, with Nature Society. Similar to what we have with the Nature Society, they they work very closely uh, with Greg. Mm -hmm. uh, but so there's nothing formalized as, as far as legally the with the relationship. I don't think so. We're just working with a citizen group in no, good faith. I mean, you know, it's just the words that they do all the fundraising. They do a lot of the improvements on their own. They come and tell us what they're going to do so we can handle the phone calls. You know, somebody's out there with a shovel digging and explain what, what guess it's authorized and that kind of thing. So, but we do aid them with providing some support in the way of, you know, signage or, or stock materials, like if they need a load of gravel or something like that. Commissioner Macy? Uh, I was just wondering, I was wondering the same thing about whether or not there's any action. If there were going to be any action, what I would propose is our directing uh, Parks and Parks DPS to have a response to this master plan and their proposed projects, um, to some kind of report that they can give to us, or perhaps just give back to them in a meeting that would take place coming up. I just didn't know, if, do we need to direct DPS to do something like that? I mean, there's a, there's a pretty long list of things to do here that I think would be hard to fundraise for entirely on your own, so I assume that you're well, expecting some city in, uh, input to that. Um, yeah. I, I Mr. Johnson, I don't know if you have a thought. On it would be appropriate if you wanted to pass a resolution asking administration to, to bring back a response to this request. And yeah. We'll, we'll work with them. So and moved. Support. Second. Okay. So we have a, a motion on the table. Discussion? I think I just said it. Okay. I figured you did, but just in case. There could be chapter two. You never know. Support. I guess I'd like to say that I would be would love to work with you on this. I do have a dog. Um, we, are, we actually are on a member of the park. Um, Basically, time. She goes in the back gate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's, the one. she's the one. You should see her kick. Trust me. It's a little scary. It's a little nerve-wracking at times. I have the gold noodle. I'm sure there's only one there, right? Oh. Yeah. If you ever lock yourself out of your house, call Commissioner Macy. She'll kick that door down. Yeah, my dog. My out. dog needs it. Well, it's not even my dog's personal issues, but um, anyway, I'd love to be involved. Okay. Good, good. Well, um, you know, I'll just add that uh, I got to tell you, this is, you know, we have a lot of things, as you can see, going on in the city. You know, problems big and small, opportunities large and, you know, small. And so uh, you guys coming together, uh, meeting with us, you know, at the coffee hour, coming up with a proposal that I got to say is really, I didn't even find a spelling or grammar area in here. So, you know, um, <laughs> I wouldn't know anyways. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure there are some grammars. I'm not the smartest person up here. I'll never, I'll, I'll never claim that. Um, so I think this is great. And I think in the short term, you know, as we're trying to figure out what's best for Mark Twain uh, Dog Park and how to make it the best, uh, in the short term, Mr. Rassel uh, will be available if there's a pet waste issue, whatever we need to do. Um, I know he does care, but, you know, if he's, he's got a lot of there's parks, lot. but we'll, uh, I think he sees a priority here and we'll, if we have a disposal company that isn't doing what they're been paid to do, then we should remedy that immediately. Okay. So, um, I would like to say one more thing is that the, the fence, um, is become almost a priority at this time because, um, mid uh, Gleason is about to start. Yeah. They're going to start here probably in the next few days. Ms. Gardner, do you have a cost estimate on that fence? You said it's about 750 feet. Yes. Yeah. J just, uh, and I'm sorry to put that on the. There's, we, we have. Two after, we did two different estimates. Okay. Um, one from Action Fence that would be, I think, residential grade was 11,150. And by the way, they're the ones who uh, enclose the nature centers. Okay. And then we have one from Midwest. If we went with industrial grade, it would be 18,750. If we went with like commercial, it would be 14995 okay, So we're in the twelve dollars to $20,000 range to... to right. did, did he come out and look at the site? Um, they, uh, Midwest was familiar with it. In fact, he knew exactly what the footage was because he was the one who originally put the fencing right, cause, up. Because the reason the fence was not completed all the way the first time was because it was going to require some clearing of the trees and putting in the fence post. It's, you know, the front part of the park is pretty easy. You post hole digger, you know, auger, just drill those holes and set the post like that. Going, once you get into the tree line, 
you're hitting roots and that kind of thing, so it's the spacing of the fence post becomes a little more challenging. But the Gleason will be clearing those trees. So we're talking right. about once Gleason has cleared the trees, then look at getting the Got fence. Got it. Right. Not doing it one before right. the other. It would be something in conjunction right. with them clearing that space, so we wouldn't have that. For sure. That would help us with that challenge. And we have seen the blueprints, and they're running curb right up to it. Okay. And the only thing that's going to separate that wooded area and their um, apartment complex, their parking lot are going to be young maple trees. Yep. So that's not much of a deterrent for children. It's not much of a deterrent for dogs who are running at full speed. Mm -hmm. So we do believe that a fence is prudent. Okay. Yeah, agreed. So. Especially since it's just one strip. It's just a straight <laughs> line, guys. I mean, come on. Right. Straight <laughs> down. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. This has been very helpful and enlightening and uh, always appreciate your time. And I know you guys weren't there, but when I was out at the park, uh, some gentlemen there were very helpful and insightful and, you know, didn't chase me out of there with their dogs. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> so should we uh, contact you or should we wait to contact me? I think Mr. Russell is going to. Yeah. Put something together, but, but oh, yeah. Wait a minute. You know what? I don't know what we're doing. We, we have to vote on the motion. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. So <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Late. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Coco, thank I'm you. sorry if you're watching. Coco Seward. She's our oh. parliamentarian. She, you're I'm going to someone's dog. She's watching. I'm, yeah. <laughs> Coco's Coco's not going to be too. happy. You know she watches these. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That brings us to item number 13, the Michigan Liquor Control Commission license establishment requests. The first one, we have Imagine Theater, 200 North Main Street request to amend plan of operation. Chief O'Donoghue, the floor is uh, yours. Yes, Mayor, City Commission, we do have a request to change their plan of operation. Specifically, they're requesting to renovate their overall floor plan to remove the first floor bowling alleys, or bowling lanes rather, add additional movie auditoriums, and replace the Ironwood restaurant with Paul's Basement Family Fun Center. Flir first floor renovations will include um, adding a 255 seat movie auditorium where the bowling center is. The restaurant will become Paul's Basement Family Fun Center. It will include video games, two pool tables, ping pong tables, shuffleboard, foosball, and uh, several pinball games. Um, total proposed interior seating will be for 71 patrons. Second floor renovations include the mezzanine room will, will be replaced with a 50 seat movie auditorium and a 10 seat private viewing box overlooking the audit, um, the audit overlooking the auditorium below and the loft room will, re will be replaced with a 24 seat movie auditorium. Uh, these proposed changes will add three movie theaters and uh, an additional 329 seats. However, it's still less than the, um, it's still a 500 seats less than what the original seating was when the uh, Imagine first opened. Um, the police department is not opposed to these changes. Um, it's important to note that if approved, the applicant will have to comply with all planning, zoning, building uh, requirements and restrictions. Right, and I do believe Mr. Glantz is in here, is here also. Do we have any questions for the chief? Mr. Glantz? I don't want to obligate you, Mr. Glantz, but if you're here and you have some things to say. I really have nothing to say, but um, this brought back some fine memories of uh, our approval process eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Like a fine wine, it's getting finer, right? It's, it is indeed. <laughs> um, any questions for Mr. Glantz? Commissioner Dubuck. Uh, yeah, just thoughts on the, the transition. It looks like you're going with more of a, a multiple gaming uh, family entertainment center as opposed to the bowling alleys. Am I understanding that right? Video games, things like that. The, uh, the 12 lanes of bowling were not 
uh, utilized very frequently. You know, it, it's uh, seasonal in Michigan, and uh, it turns out that we have more demand for movies than we can fulfill today, and, um, and a lot of unutilized space, particularly during this time of year in that 12-lane uh, bowling center. The, uh, we're going to add some elements of, uh, of games. We already have two pool tables uh, in that space, uh, but the premise would be that uh, we'll add some uh, things that folks could enjoy while perhaps they're waiting for their film to start. Okay, great. Well, being the movies are the core business, I guess that's a pretty good uh, transition to make. I think so. It is it's certainly in keeping with our core competency. And, uh, you know, all we're doing really is sh uh, shifting the proportionality a bit. We, we're still going to have the four bowling lanes on the second story. Uh, that's proven to be a, uh, uh, a very well-attended and well-received area. And so we intend to uh, maintain the star lanes uh, on the second floor. All right. I'm glad to see you continuing to invest in uh, your business in the city and I hope this is a tremendous success for you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. I'll move for approval. A motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Macy. Discussion? Commissioner Macy. I just had one more question. When do you think this would take place if we approve it here tonight? Uh, we hope to have it uh, all completed before Christmas. Oh, wow. Very good. Any other discussions, questions? Good time to watch movies. Yeah? Yeah, yeah perfect timing. Especially when it's cold outside. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just add, you know, I mean, we do go to the, the bowling from time to time uh, with our family. We take advantage of your very lucrative pricing for happy hour. Um, but I think, you know, just on a personal perspective, you know, we've always uh, had a great time at your theater. And, um, you know, I think adding a different, you know, type of excitement with the gaming that you have presented here, I know our kids will probably enjoy it more than watching dad get frustrated with all his gutter balls so um <laughs> well, we'll still have uh, retail bowling on the second floor great so they can continue i, I, I can still embarrass myself <laughs> thank you thank you mr glance yes, i appreciate indeed, that, that opportunity to continue to embarrass myself <laughs> no this is good this is really good and you've been a strong partner in the city and we just appreciate you uh coming forward and constantly uh or not constantly but taking this opportunity to uh make some changes to accommodate the 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 changes in royal oak so delighted to be here we uh support all the progress that's being made in the city of Royal Oak, and we're delighted to continue to be a, a, a contributing member of the community. Thank you, Mr. Glantz. All right. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Unanimous vote. Thank Couldn't you so much. imagine a better vote. Oh, God. <laughs> Thank you so kindly. <laughs> all right. This brings us to item number 13B, uh, Pronto 515, 600 to 610 Washington Avenue, request to amend the plan of operation. Chief. Yes, Mayor City Commission, this is just a small change of the plan of operation, specifically uh, 515 is requesting to open two hours earlier on uh, Monday through Sunday. Um, this proposed change will allow them to serve coffee uh, in the early morning hours. Alcohol will not be served at this time. Um, uh, everything else remains the same, and the police department has no objection to this request. Any questions for the chief? Commissioner Pruce. I'll move approval of this request. We have a motion by Commissioner Pruce, second by Commissioner Dubach. Discussion? Okay. I'm just convinced because we had a coffee hour there that, you know, people want to do it much earlier. So that's why we got to <laughs> open up two more hours early. Uh, but it's a great fun place, Gary. Uh, Mr. Baglio, sorry. And uh, the more hours you open, the more fun everyone will have. So, all right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. All right. Time to make the donuts. All right. That brings us to item number 13C, which is the Royal Oak Good Times Food and Drink Incorporated, Cantina Diablo, 100 South Main Street, request to amend the plan of operation. Chief. Uh, Mayor City Commission, uh, the, specifically the applicants are requesting to change their format, floor plan, and doing business as names. Cantina Diablos will become Diamond Steak and Seafood. Um, Red Fox will become Pinkies. Additionally, Mer Merkel Royal Oak LLC is obtaining a 40% of the stock in Royal Oak Good Times Food and Drink Incorporated. Um, Merkel Royal Oak LLC is solely owned by Adam Merkel. The existing stockholders 
of Royal Oak Good Times Food and Drink will remain will remain the same. The applicants will be spending approximately three hundred and sixty thousand dollars on renovations, which will include new furniture and cosmetic updates. Um, Mr. Merkel grew up in the restaurant business and has an extensive history in managing restaurants. He currently owns and operates Cello Italian Restaurant as well as Diamonds Steak and Seafood Silver Pig and Howell. Both locations hold a Class C liquor license. Um, we've contacted the Howell Police Department and they spoke very highly of Mr. Merkel. Um, if approved, Diamonds will operate as an American steak and seafood restaurant offering um, steak, seafood, pasta, chicken, uh, sandwiches. Um, requested hours of operation are Monday through Thursday, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Friday and Saturday, 11 a.m. until midnight. Um, Sunday, 9 a.m. till 11 p.m. Diamonds will have interior seating from uh, for 172 patrons, including 13 at the bar. This is a reduction in 41 seats. Um, they'll keep the existing outdoor service area on, and the main, uh, on Main Street, the sidewalk cafe for 16 patrons. The existing roll-up garage doors will remain in place and French doors will be added to create an interior open air screen patio. Um, the dance floor will be eliminated. Um, on the second floor, Pinkies will offer small plates and uh, various menu items. The requested hours of operation will be Monday through Saturday from 11 a.m. until 2 a.m. and Sunday from 9 a.m. until 2 a.m. They'll have seating for 142 patrons, including 14 seats at the bar and 58 seats in the outdoor service area. This is a reduction of 26 seats. They'll be doing some renovations on the outdoor service area, so that area will be able to be utilized year-round. Um, and that all the changes will be subject to approval from the planning, uh, building and planning departments. Pinkies will continue to have a 10 by 10 dance floor. There'll be no live entertainment, dancing or pipe can music in the outdoor service area. Um, they've agreed to uh, strictly adhere to the city's sound ordinance as well as the dance and entertainment permits agreement, permit agreements. Um, uh, if approved, these applicants will have to comply with all planning, zoning, building requirements and restrictions. The police department has no objections to these changes. We have questions for the chief. No questions? All right. Ms. Allen, Mr. Kramer, I see you. You're here. Ms. Merkel? Come on up. If you wish. I mean, we can... Go, go base every decision on the report of uh, our police chief, but if you're yeah, here, nice. I figure you want to speak. Always. <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission, I'm Kelly Allen, and this is Adam Merkel. Um, he is the new improved Brian Kramer. No. Um, <laughs> and as much as um, Brian's demise has been greatly exaggerated, he will still be operating Good Times um, Royal Oak in, in conjunction with Adam. Um, Adam's the new kid on the block. He brings a really great concept to the city, I think. You know, restaurants have to change. They have to evolve. Their concepts have to, to, to meld into what's coming and what's going and and um, Brian and his partner Kevin Downey have worked long and hard to find a, a partner such as Adam um, to come in and do just that so um, the chief did a, a perfect job of describing what's going to go on here um, in, in when it's all said and done, you're going to have a steak and seafood house on the downstairs. It's going to be renovated. It's going to be beautiful. Upstairs is going to be similar menu items, but with a you know a longer hours of operation type theme. And um, they're going to do some extensive renovation upstairs too. Adam does come from a long background of, of operating restaurants. He's real good at it. And um, Brian has a lot of faith in, in him, as does Kevin Downey, his partner. And um, we're just real hopeful that the city will welcome this this new concept by the same company. Company and um, and introducing this new new place for the city. Wonderful. Questions? Commissioner Dubuck. Sure. Just wondering, you know, what kind of thought you put into uh, this concept and why this is the right location at the right time uh, to bring this this particular concept to the city. Sure. Um, nice to meet everyone. Thank you. Um, Brian and I have been uh, discussing this for uh, quite a long time, and um, our Howell restaurants have luckily been very successful, and Diamond seems to be the one that just keeps 
uh, going faster and harder than any of them. So uh, just looking at the area, um, there's really no steak and seafood, you know, no steakhouse for sure, you know, in the area. Um, and uh, that corner, you know, is obviously you guys know how well uh, the potential is for that. And I think it just needed the con concept change and it seemed to be a good fit with Brian and I. So, um, yeah, we're excited to, you know, bring our uh, culinary passion and our hospitality into uh, Royal Oak. And uh, we hope uh, everyone will enjoy it. Great, thanks. Good. Commissioner Douglas. Ms. Allen said this, but it, it bears repeating that in the restaurant industry, you're always reinventing. I mean, very few restaurants, you look at Metro Detroit, have stayed the same over, you know, the course of 20, 30, or 40 years. And you always have to look at your market, too. And there are options for, you know, Mexican food in uh, Royal Oak, but there is no steakhouse. Um, and I, for one, appreciate it. Um, I think it's something that appeals to grown-ups. Um, to people with disposable income and you're seeing that coming into you know right outside your back door with office workers I think this is just a, a very smart choice um, we very much appreciate the fact that you're going to sink $360,000 into this renovation um, and wish you the best of success thank you very much Commissioner Dubuck move for approval motion Sorry. by Commissioner Dubuck second by Commissioner Perush discussion <clears throat> Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, I'm going way out of order here all night, so might as well continue with that. I suppose in some weird way I'm in order by remaining out of order all the time. Um, you know, certainly, Mr. Kramer, uh, not a knock against your existing uh, business that you have today, but um, I do appreciate the new concept coming in, uh, amending your plan of operation. Uh, certainly, none of us sound like we have any beef with a steakhouse here. Sorry, one dad joke for, for agenda item. Um, but I, I think um, I mean, this is great. I had a chance to peruse what you're doing out in Howell, and certainly your creations are, are, are pretty amazing, and I think the palette here in Royal Oak certainly supports it. And, you know, we're excited to see you continue with your success and on this new venture. So um, appreciate you being in front of us tonight. All right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank Good you. luck, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Royal Oak, Mr. Markle. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, that brings us to item number 14 on the agenda, short-term rentals report. I know we put that action out, oh, a couple months ago, maybe, maybe a little bit longer, and we have a report, Mr. Johnson. Actually, this is actually Chief O. Is it Chief O'Donoghue? Yes. All right. Uh, yes, Mayor, I, we do have a report on these uh, short-term rentals. It is a um, uh, something we weren't, uh, at least I personally wasn't super familiar with, but a quick search of Airbnb uh, revealed we have over 300 available rentals in Royal Oak alone. Um, according to Jason Craig, we have 3,268 registered rentals. Um, at the time, the building department didn't distinguish between short-term and regular rentals and then these um, Airbnb short-term rentals type, type rentals. Um, we reviewed police calls and we could find no connection between any of these short-term rentals and loud parties, disturbance, complaints. Um, although in February of 2018, the DEA did, uh, was involved in the arrest of three individuals who did use an Airbnb in Royal Oak um, to conduct a large-scale illegal drug sale. Um, Royal Oak wasn't selected in that case for any particular reason. They just would utilize Airbnb. That's how this drug trafficking organization worked. Um, uh, it is possible that there's homeowners who have problems but um, with these rentals but don't notify the police department. Um, the, the genesis of this report seemed to be a St. Patrick's Day loud party. We reviewed our police calls and um, we only went to the same address twice. Um, and uh, there the didn't seem to be loud party complaints, but it was, um, it's possible that could have been an Airbnb, but it's not something we can really pinpoint. Um, we've uh, asked our officers moving forward that when they're going to loud parties or disturbance 
calls to try to determine if this in fact is one of the short-term rentals, Airbnb or another one. And then we're gonna be logging that on the calls for service, so we'll be better able to track that. Also, the building department has changed a field on their rental application, so they'll be able to track who's getting an application and if, whether it's a short or long-term rental. Although we're not recommending any um, any regulations currently, I have included uh, three communities and and how they are attempting to regulate these. Uh, but it, in speaking with them, it, it's it's a problem that is not an easy solution. Uh, Traverse City was an example where in residential areas you can't do the short-term rentals, and they think they're changing that because there's a lot of push to allow for that. Um, uh, I, I, the concern seems to be, uh, particularly in these more touristy areas, of investors just buying up properties for the sole purpose of it being a short-term rental. And um, we did get an uh, an article from uh, Commissioner Perouche where it seems like Boston might have figured out a way of preventing that. I don't know. That's what the article seemed to include, but didn't have a, a link to it. So we haven't looked into that, how they've done that. I don't know that that's a problem in Royal Oak, but um, because we really don't have any data to show this is a problem, we didn't make a recommendation. So, Questions for the chief on the report. Commissioner Perouche. Uh, not a question, but another piece of information that we all ought to keep in the back of our minds. I went to a conference um, last week of um, real property lawyers. It wasn't all boring, but there was one legislative update element uh, item which was pretty interesting. There is a House Bill 4503, which was introduced in Lansing. There has been no committee work, no reports, no nothing. It's just been sitting in committee for quite a while. Um, if it goes through, it would add a section to the Zoning Enabling Act, which would add all of the following, it would say all of the following apply to any rental of any dwelling, including short-term rentals. Um, number one, it is considered residential use of property and is permitted in all residential zones. It is not subject to a special use permit or a conditional use permit. It is not a commercial use of property. And this is important because there are a lot of homeowner uh, restrictions, subdivision restrictions, which restrict the use of a residential property to just residential and it prohibits commercial use. And they are therefore prohibiting them because they're saying, well, you're renting the property, it's a commercial use. This would codify in statute that a short-term rental is not a commercial use. Um, it wouldn't prohibit the regulation of, um, of noise, activity, or advertising, or traffic, or other conditions, but those conditions would have to apply to all types of property, not just short-term rentals. In other words, they couldn't pick on short-term rentals and say, you know, for your purposes it's this, but for everybody else it's different. Uh, it would define a short-term rental as any single family or one to four family house or dwelling unit or any condominium unit in a condominium development uh, for less than 28 days at a time. And the interesting thing is that the people who work with the real property law section as liaisons to the legislature expects this to be on a fast track in the lame duck session. It is gonna get rammed through. And they say that the people who are trying to push really, really hard are those people who are in the tourism industry who think that this is a, a really cool thing and uh, beneficial to their members and to their businesses. And they are pushing this so that local governments for all intents and purposes would be prohibited from regulating short-term rentals under the terms as it's written here. Um, they said there might be a little bit of pushback and you might get in there, um, local governments might be able to license, um, local governments might be able to say, well, you can only have them in certain locations, um, but they said essentially don't hold your breath because this they expect this to come through, they expect it to be tough, they expect it to have not too many exceptions, so our ability to regulate and the ability of other communities um, who already have big regulatory schemes in place is going to disappear. Mm -hmm. So it'll happen at 2 o'clock in the morning sometime in the lame duck session and then we're going to have to live with it. So um, to the extent that we're thinking that perhaps we're going to need some kind of regulation in the future, you know, we're just going to have to wait and see what the legislature does because we have no idea how much authority we're going to end up with when they're all done. So that's, that's all I know about this. So Commissioner Perush, if I may ask a question. Yes. Um, so 
actually will have no control over short-term rentals, which could be people coming in literally in a every day for 28 days. But people, we would have some sort of um, licensing regulation um, ability remaining in place for people that are living there for a year, that are our neighbors and signing 12-month leases and all of that. Um, no. I, I don't think that that's the intent, and I think if the language implies that now, they're going to find to, a way to finesse the language so okay. that there's it's clear that there's a distinction between short-term rentals and long-term rentals. I don't know how they're going to do that, but you know, they'll figure out something, and then there will be court cases challenging the language as sure. to whether or not it's <clears throat> too restrictive, what does this mean, I'm not short-term, whatever. So, um, but anyway, that it's it's out there. And it's going to move fast. And lame duck is September, a week in September. It's before. It's way before after the, the election. Octo I don't know when it is. Is it after Probably the election? November to January. After, after the election. The election. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, before. That, yes, you're right. Anyway, that's apparently what the expectation is. So it's it's sitting there very quietly. No one's talking about it very much, but they expect it to ram through in the lame duck session. And I confirmed all of that with the Michigan Municipal League uh, this morning. Uh, they agree with the Commissioner Perusha's assessment that it's the, and this is being, uh, the, the push for this is realtors. Um, they, you know, want to protect the rights of um, businesses to turn these into exactly what communities like ours are trying to fight, which is commercial enterprises. And uh, yes, they're predicting that it'll, it will go through lame duck. The effect on long, here's the effect on long long-term rentals on, on, you know, people who just want to rent a house for a year. Uh, the legislation defines the term as anything under 28 days. And so the fear is that landlords will now, I mean, if I come in and I want to rent there for a year, the landlord is going to have me sign a contract that is a series of 28-day renewable contracts and therefore put us under the radar or lump us into that same category. Um, the the MML also says that this is a real threat to the zoning and planning and zoning enabling act. That this is the camel's nose in the tent, and once they do this, there are other things that are, that they're going to try and affect. And what they're doing here is taking away local government control. They're putting this decision, which I mean, to me, zoning is the quintessential local decision. That's where people decide what they want their community to look like and what they want their community how they want their community to operate. And this takes away that completely. And, and, you know, from people who say they want small government, what they're doing is turning this responsibility over to big government, that is a state law. So if anybody feels the same as I do, contact your state rep representative and your state senator. Um, I will say this, and full disclosure, I rent a room in my home through Airbnb, um, but I did look at the listings in Royal Oak, and what I did was I picked kind of a sample weekend in September, and there aren't 300 Airbnb listings in Royal Oak. There are like maybe, at, at that particular time, 40. So, I mean, if you look at what's available, I mean, what you can rent in Royal Oak as, and that was both for rooms and freestanding homes or apartments, um, it was under 50. And I think sometimes what they do is they might say even include, if you do a search on Royal Oak, some of the ones in proximity, it could be Clawson, it could be Detroit. I'm yeah, looking at it right on. now, you know, Hamtramck, um, yeah. Ferndale, w Detroit's West Village. So, um, yeah, you may look in Royal Oak, but you get a lot more than that. So. What I'm hearing, what I'm processing is we have a report. Um, I think the police chief did a great job looking into this. I think we don't really know at this time, do we have a hypothetical situation, do we have an incident, or do we have a problem? Um, I know our police department is now tracking it to get at least a little bit more data on the, the issue if there is one. We also ha have a looming, potentially looming, lame duck bill here, 4503, that could render all activities and efforts by this body useless uh, moving forward. Um, you know, I think there is a... Uh, I'm glad we are at least looking into this and we have some background on it now because, there, you know, I mean, we have to prepare, and as Royal Oak becomes, um, you know, uh, a popular place to work, live, and play, I mean, of course, it makes sense that you know people will want to, you know, rent out their rooms or rent out their their entire homes, and we got to be cognizant of the impacts that could potentially have in the neighborhoods. Um, 
full disclosure, uh, we own a property in Traverse City, and from time to time we use Airbnb to uh, offset some of the cost. Uh, but that's in a central business district covered by, you know, we really don't see uh, the issues that we're talking about here uh, in the neighborhood. So um, I know personally, I mean, just thinking about my neighborhood, there's a couple rental homes on the street that could easily convert to Airbnbs. And, you know, we got 11 kids on one block, and I don't know who's coming and going. I don't know if we'd even have control. Who's buying and selling houses? Who's renting them for six months a year? But I think it's worth continuing to keep on the radar here. But I'm sensing we need a little bit more information. Commissioner Dubuck? Yeah, I, I don't know that we have a problem to be solved yet. Um, the problem with this bill is, as Lansing continues to uh, decimate you know, our long tradition of being a home rule state, uh, it's going to prevent us from collecting data to identify if we do have a problem. So I think the only real issue we have on the table right now is combating this bill. So I think what we'll need to do is at the very least pass a resolution um, you know, encouraging our legislators to stand up for local control on this issue so that if in the future our residents demand action on this, we actually can do it. And this is clearly the kind of thing that's going to impact different communities differently. You right. see the three communities the chief identified here are very much like touristy kind of beach towns where this is going to be a surging business. And I think for your for your full-time residents, uh, you know, they're going to have some needs and some concerns that the local government should be able to address. I don't know that it's going to rise to that level in Royal Oak. What I do know is that our residents deserve for us to be able to respond to it if it does. Right. So, um, you know, I'll move that we pass a resolution in opposition to House Bill 4503 to be drafted for a future meeting. Motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Sir, second by Commissioner Douglas. That we direct Support. staff to draft. Uh, I'm sorry. That we direct staff to draft a resolution in opposition to the House Bill. I think there's a Senate bill tied to this. I could be wrong about that. I couldn't find one. Um, I didn't look very long. House Bill. I'm not showing a tie bar, but there may be an identical bill in the Senate. 329. At one point, there was 329. Yeah. Okay. So. How about any legislation that's pending in sure. front of the Michigan legislature? And specifically citing the bills that we're aware of. That would be my motion, Support. that we draft a resolution in opposition. Okay. And can we copy neighboring communities? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, discussion on this motion. Commissioner Lavasser. This is a resolution that wasn't on our agenda tonight. I think it would be better if it were put off until a future agenda. If people want to comment on it, they have an opportunity to comment on it. <clears throat> Commissioner Dubas, to clarify, my motion is to direct staff to draft a resolution that we'll be voting on uh, at a future meeting. So the resolution will be brought to an agenda, a, a coming agenda. We're not voting on the resolution tonight. Any other discussion? Call from the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Mayor, one more thing. Oh, sorry. Oh, Commissioner Dubuck. Uh, yeah, just uh, curious if staff has any uh, idea if MML has taken a position on this, if there's anything we can do to back their position, if they've spoken out uh, about this issue. No, it's not my committee. I'm not, I know this, I know they're opposed to it. Sure. Um, I don't know if, uh, I'll find that out, if they okay. voted to oppose it. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm wondering if they've made it a legislative priority. I know these lo the local control issues generally rise to the top. Thanks. All right, that brings us to item number 15, the proposed ballot language, public transit system millage. Mr. Gillum. That's me. <coughs> Mayor and Commissioners, after the uh, commission meeting on June 25th and the presentation from the local transit task force, I was tasked to prepare proposed ballot language um, for a related five-year 1.25 millage request uh, to support ROGO, the fixed route transit plan recommended by the transit task force. Um, you have proposed ballot language in front of you. Um, the language would be subject to the approval of the governor's office because it would involve a change to the city charter. But this is the same format that we have used for other uh, millage proposals in the past. I don't expect there will be an issue, but again, we're 
would have to wait for formal approval for the governor. But um, again, this would call for a roll call vote. Um, and if approved, this language would be, then be sent to the governor's office and the attorney general's office for formal approval to be placed on the, in the November ballot. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Questions? Commissioner Lavasser? I, I note that there's the term fixed route in here. And if I'm reading that correctly, this kind of ties our hands or the hands of future commissions where they might not be able to experiment with, say, an Uber or a Lyft type of, of subsidy, such as what our DDA recently did. And I'm just wondering if, if that could be changed to, uh, to perhaps give a greater, greater discretion to the commission. Um, we could certainly uh, um, modify the language and you could delete any reference to a fixed route public transit system and maybe just make a general reference to a public transit system. Uh, the only reason I put fixed route in here is because I think the report from the task force was fairly specific as to what their recommendation was, but we're by no means uh, tied into that language in the resolution. So. Commissioner Dubuc. Uh, I agree. I think that kind of flexibility, the intent right now is to put the question before the voters based on the uh, proposal that was put forward. Um, but I agree there's no reason to lock us in and prevent experimentation because this is a very innovative concept uh, to begin with for a city of our size. So allowing future commissions to determine uh, if it needs to be tweaked um, or uh, as was raised to public comment, um, if it, it just is not uh, working if it's not providing the value, I think we need to leave those decisions open to future commissions. Mr. Gibbs? And as, our, as the demographics of our city continue continually change, I, I think it's important that we have the opportunity to vary instead of just being a fixed bus route, the Uber, the... I don't want to call it a taxi, but, you know, more flexibility and even with door-to-door -door service for users of the system. Mr. Lavasser. What kind of clock are we working with, deadlines to get this to the governor and the attorney general in order to meet uh, the November ballot? Ballot language has to be uh, approved and submitted to the county by Tuesday, August 14th. Um, so um, if this uh, resolution is approved in any form by the city commission tonight, I'll work with uh, Ms. Hallis. We'll get it cleaned up, and I would assume she'll send it up to Lansing tomorrow. That's her normal practice. Douglas. Uh, the, the point about fixed route is well made because, in fact, we are already operating part of a system that is not fixed route. The, the senior program mm -hmm. is an on-demand service. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the fixed route, the words fixed route do seem limiting, um, too limiting. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dubuck. Uh, so... Can I move for the resolutions presented with the elimination of the term fixed route? Is that sufficient? I believe so, yeah. And, and just uh, based upon a quick review, it looks like that would, would mean we would pull the uh, fixed route reference out of um, paragraph F mm -hmm. on page three of my memo and then out of the actual ballot language, which appears at the bottom of page three. Okay. But if there are any other references in the resolution, we would also pull those out as well. I think that works without really changing the meaning or the understanding at all. It just frees up future commissions to consider public transit in a, right. a more broad sense. I, I'd agree it would allow for more flexibility in the future. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, so I'll make that motion. So a motion by Commissioner Dubuck, second by Commissioner Douglas. We have to do a roll call vote here. Uh, Commissioner Douglas, you have an error. Uh, too many D's. <laughs> Commissioner Dubuck. Sure. I, just, you know, I think we, we received a really thorough presentation on this from the group that worked for the last year of, uh, you know, residents and activists on transit. Um, you know, I don't know if this is 
the big win, right? I don't. I mean, certainly, it's uh, it's not uh, replacing well, a regional transit system, which we certainly desperately need. Uh, but our residents voted overwhelmingly for regional transit. Um, I think there is great interest in increasing mobility for for youth and for seniors and for folks just trying to get uh, to the main places to visit in our city. Uh, and I think this is a reasonable question to put before residents. If residents embrace it then wonderful, we'll do it. If residents uh, are not compelled by the proposal that's been put forward, uh, then you know, we'll keep moving on. Uh, but I think asking the question is, is, is completely appropriate given uh, the resounding support that our residents put forward for uh, a regional transit system, which appears uh, to be a non-starter uh, in the coming years. So uh, I think I'm happy to put this question before voters and, and let the conversation begin. Mr. Levasseur? I'm happy that the term fixed road is being eliminated in this proposal because it was very limiting. Uh, that said, I, I really, bef before we were to put this before voters, uh, I, I really would like to have had input from the task force. Uh, being a little bit more creative and looking at Lyft and looking at Uber and looking at other alternatives, uh, the, the, the proposal that was presented to us when you crunched the numbers worked out to uh, $20 per rider to move maybe three or four miles. Uh, and that's just $20 from the royal taxpayers. That's not even counting what subsidies there are from the federal or the state government or what fares the uh, the riders were, were, were contributing. Uh, it, it's just... It's a proposal without a good plan behind it, and I can't support it right now. Mr. Douglas. Having served on the task force, I will say that we did give due consideration to the private ride-sharing ride services that are available, and while they may well become a part of what we do, and in fact those businesses may very well want to tie in, find it advantageous for them to come to us to tie into what we're doing, the, the fact that not everybody has a smartphone, not everybody, you know, can afford to use a Lyft or Uber. The fact that this system ties into the regional system, even the one that exists right now, um, uh, I can pay, I'm over 65, I can pay 50 cents and ride from my front door to Metro Airport. Um, I, that's a, a benefit that I think many people will embrace. Um, I do think the task force, we spent almost a year on this, thinking it through, um, and I'm extremely confident that we've investigated all of the possible options and put together the best report, the best plan. Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, the voters did speak on the RTA, and I think it's a fair question to ask. We've talked about the silver tsunami coming ahead of us, and the more we start to put this question to voters that are going to have mobility uh, concerns in the future, I think the better. Um, we've also fielded a number of questions related to school busing, even though that's not within our jurisdiction. But I think parents um, and everyone else in the community needs to, um, you know, have a say, given the, the support of the RTA. RTA um, when that was voted on, at least how the votes added up here in Royal Oak. I think um, keeping it a little broader uh, is important. Um, mobility is changing to the extent that we can remain agile. I think we can provide this uh, critical human service to our residents that need it. We have changes in our um, community. We're bringing jobs into our community. Um, we have the silver tsunami coming. And of course, we're seeing investments from Beaumont, the zoo, et cetera. So um, to the extent that we can remain flexible, but yet still have a, um, uh, an option for people to vote on, I think is important. So um, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm, again, you know, the voters did vote for the RTA. We listened, we put together a task force. They did a really robust job and uh, analyzed a lot of things, made a pitch. And uh, so we'll put it in the wisdom of the voters that we trust. So, all right, no further discussion. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Oh, wait, roll call roll vote. vote. Yeah, I'm the one that kept saying roll call vote, and then I forgot. Jeez, so the maker of the motion will start with Commissioner Dubuck. Aye. I vote aye. Commissioner Douglas. Aye. Commissioner Macy. Aye. Commissioner Levasseur. Nay. Nay. Uh, okay, Sorry. Commissioner Gibbs. All right, <laughs> nay. Okay, and Commissioner Perouche. Yes. Okay, all right. Well, I'll do the tally. It seems like it's five to two. So, um, Mr. Gillum, just remind us of the next steps with this. Well, we'll uh, make the changes to the uh, <coughs> resolution that's been approved. Ms. Hallis' office will forward uh, 
a copy of the resolution to the governor's office and also in the interest of time to the attorney general's office. The attorney general's office will review the proposed charter amendment for compliance with the Home Rule City Act. Um, assuming they are comfortable, they will notify the governor of their approval, then the governor will approve, will be notified, and then the uh, proposal will appear on the ballot in November. So, okay. Everyone understand? Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gillen. Just a 10 second update on another proposal that has previously been approved by the commission for the ballot. Uh, the clerk's office received correspondence today or a copy of correspondence today from the attorney general's office to the governor advising that the ballot language for the sidewalk millage has been approved for the ballot by the AG. So we expect we'll be receiving a similar letter from the governor's office, which will be formal notification that the sidewalk millage will be appearing on the November ballot as well. Thank you for that update. All right, that brings us to item number 16, the adoption of emergency operation plan. I see um, Chief O'Donoghue here. Yes, Mayor, City Commission, um, in cooperation with Oakland County Emergency Management, um, Royal Oak Police Department has recently completed a review and update of our uh, support emergency operations plan. This is a, requ this is a four year requirement to do this. Um, the plan's in front of you and uh, suggested resolution. If you have any questions. Questions for the chief. No questions. Commissioner Pruch. I'll move approval of the resolution. We have a motion by Commissioner Pruch and second by Commissioner Dubuck. Discussion. Okay, with no discussion. And now that Commissioner Douglas is seated, we'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. All right, thank you, Chief. Um, this brings us to item number 17, Stormwater Task Force Report and Recommendations. Mr. Prison. Yes, good evening, Mayor and City Commission. Um, in November 2016, City Manager Johnson appointed an informal group of advisors. Uh, this was a group of business owners, civil engineers, environmental planners, and different stakeholders in the community, most of whom uh, were residents of the city of Royal Oak, to start looking at initially our stormwater detention ordinance. Um, through the work, the scope of the task force began to grow um, and the issues they were looking at. Uh, stormwater is still an issue that we are dealing with here in the city. Um, prior to the August 2014 rain event, a uh, business-led task force was arguing for relaxing the stormwater detention standards uh, because the current standards do discourage property owners from making improvements because they will trigger stormwater detention requirements. Uh, obviously, we can't allow a relaxing of the standards. Uh, stormwater is everybody's problem. Um, currently, our stormwater detention ordinance does exempt all one and two family residential property and all property in the central business district from the requirements. Basically, it's putting um, most of the burden for detention on relatively few properties, um, which and is still a significant impediment to property maintenance and improvement. Um, these improvements we are trying to encourage so that these property owners are then going to provide some more stormwater detention. Um, also, we're finding that a common practice now in, in the city is for new homes that are being built where old homes once stood, uh, as they're grading the property, they end up sending stormwater onto neighbors' property, which is something we can't allow. Um, another issue we were dealing with is that we are one of the last communities to discharge into the GWK drain. Um, it's important to understand that like our system, the size of the GWK, GWK drain and the amount of water that enters it um, limits the amount of improvements that can be made um, with putting water into the system. We can't just simply build bigger pipes. 
Um, the final major issue we're looking at is the fact that our method of recapturing stormwater debt um, has been altered by recent litigation. As part of our settlement with, uh, in the Schroeder versus the City of Royal Oak case, we were, requ we were required to alter the methodology for recapturing the debt component, component of the stormwater system. Uh, we used to be able to recapture the debt through our sewer charges. We can no longer do this. For this current year, we are recapturing this, this funding through um, an ad valorem tax, which is allowed under the drain code. However, this isn't exactly a great solution as property value it really has no bearing on the, t the amount of water we put into the system. Um, it also does not discourage property owners to manage their stormwater as there's no financial benefit for them to do so. So looking at all these issues, uh, the task force came up with some recommendations, which I'll go through a few of them here. Um, they were broken out into three categories. One had to do with the stormwater detention ordinance. One had to do with stormwater management planning. And the last had to do with funding. Um, the ordinance should be rewritten and should include green infrastructure as an acceptable method to achieve compliance. Um, the ordinance should also include current and accurate descriptions of the various detention methods that would be acceptable to meet the standards in the ordinance. We need to um, eliminate the exemption for one and two family residentials, um, and we should require compliance with storm water management by all new and re renovated properties within the city, regardless of zoning category. This would include the central business district. Uh, we also need to either within this ordinance or within another ordinance, prohibit property owners from conveying their stormwater runoff onto neighboring properties. Um, looking at stormwater management planning, which we don't have a full comprehensive stormwater management plan. Uh, we, we are recommending that we adopt and implement a stormwater management plan that would have a program to include every property in some manner. It would include the use of green infrastructure. It would include a reduction in the overall imperviousness of the city. Uh, would include a vigorous program of public education and would also include an effective and reliable source of funding. And finally, um, this task force is recommending that the city create and implement a stormwater utility user fee. Uh, this would apply to all privately owned property within the city. It should be sufficient enough to cover the distribution and transmission costs, including debt, on the transmission system. Uh, the, the utility would also provide for credits to those who install approved stormwater detention. Um, the costs for properties would be based on parcel size and estimated runoff. Uh, we need to incentivize private property owners to comply with detention. Um, the user fee would basically then be covering fund operations such as maintenance and replacement of the system, um, as well as the costs that are passed on to us for transmission um, and the debt service. So this uh, report was provided to you, and I'm happy to take any questions. So Mr. Crisman, I have a question for you. I, I think this is a really complicated topic. And we had a question come up during public comment, and I think, you know, just hearing people discuss this issue, you, there, there's a distinction between detention and, you know, the payment for the system. And currently today, um, the way you're, the, the task force uh, is positioning it, I'll probably talk right here so people can hear me, is that um, the right now really only 33% of the property owners in town, which are commercial property, can actually are incentivized or motivated or are required to improve the amount of water they're putting into the storm system, primarily when they decide to resurface their parking lot or do certain changes to their buildings. Whereas, like for example, you know, if I were to build an addition on my house or, you know, tear down a house and build a new one, um, I, I have no requirement to improve. In fact, I could add to the runoff into the system uh, today and that's where you're saying you know it's not a payment issue it's a right now the incentives and I use that word very loosely or the ability to reduce it all lies within the commercial properties right. outside the central business district absolutely yeah commercial industrial um, all non one and two family homes all non but to be fair the payment 
one and two family homes, everybody here is paying for the sewer system today, the stormwater management today through our water bill. Right. And so it's not like this, you know, I mean, it, it costs money to you're, remove stormwater. You're, you're paying for part of it now through your, your water right. and sewer bill. Mm -hmm. As of July 1st, the debt service on the George Coon drain was removed from the water bill. So historically, I mean, historically, let's go back a year yes, ago, yes. Um, you know, we obviously it's a very it's less glamorous been an important topic we have to get the stormwater out of our community and we have to get other things out of our community as well uh, and that goes into the drain and then the the issue on the detention ordinance the detention ordinance as it's written right now is not based on on incentives or, or trying to encourage things it's it's based on a hard requirement but we phased the requirement in in such a manner that property owners can defer that for years or even decades uh, and many half uh, by simply not making an improvement right um, they're not required to, to to put in detention commissioner Pruish. Um, uh, i'm a member of the stormwater <coughs> task force um, and uh, James is correct when we when he says that when we started out this process, it was in response to the business communities wanting us to take a look at the detention ordinance um, and modify it in some way so that there was not the disincentive to improve the property because it would trigger the detention requirements. The detention portion of the ordinance is quite old. I can't remember now when it was drafted, but it hasn't been amended for years. Um, and it certainly wasn't amended, it wasn't put in place um, given the type of land uses that we have in the community now, and certainly not in light of the types of rain events that we've been getting, and certainly not in terms of the, the recent litigation, which significantly alters our options in terms of paying for stormwater. So that's how we started out, was taking a look or wanting to take a look at that detention ordinance to see if they could be modified in some way. Um, along with that, um, the task force recognized that in order to manage stormwater, we needed to look much, much more closely as a community on those green infrastructure elements that we could employ, not only on our own property, but also as a component of other development property within the community so that um, we could utilize the best technology possible to um, diminish the need for stormwater fees and stormwater management. Uh, the more you can put in the ground, the less you have to go into the pipe and the less you have to pay for. So that was the second major element or, or topic that the task force started with. Um, and the, the question of a stormwater utility was always there. We were reading a lot of research about um, other communities like Ann Arbor, which have had a stormwater utility in place for quite some time. Um, and, and we recognize that in the long term, that's probably the best practice to use because you actually pay on the basis of how much stormwater runs off your property. And that's, that's an easy way, it, it's not easy, but you can measure that. And that seemed to be the fairest way to handle stormwater fees. But but at the beginning, anyway, it was like, well, ideally, uh, yeah, that would be terrific, but we, we're going to have to work toward that. Well, then the litigation happened, and we realized that, oh, my gosh, we have to radically and soon, by July of this year, change the way we pay for stormwater um, disposal, discharge fees. Um, and so that issue came to the forefront real quickly. As soon as we got involved with that litigation, we realized what the limitations we had. Um, because that leaves you with basically just two funding sources for um, dealing with stormwater. You can't use um, how much water your household uses anymore because that's what the litigation said you can't use anymore. Uh, the other alternative is using the millage that we've got in place, and that's even more unfair because it's based on property value, which has nothing to do with stormwater whatsoever. Um, so uh, once we realized that, we realized we have to get moving really quickly and move into a, a system of, of of paying for stormwater discharge, which we've all been paying for forever. We pay for rain discharge, unfortunately. Um, 
and, and this seemed to be the fairest system. But it is an extraordinarily complicated system, as you can tell if you've read the engineering reports and the reports of the of OHM on the next item on the agenda, what they're going to have to do in order to put this in place. The goal is to get it done within a year so that we can get rid of that millage, which we all hate, um, because it's such an unfair system, um, and get in something in place that's much more fair. But it, it's, it's going to take a, holo, a heck of a lot of work to do it properly. It's going to take a lot of community education, as we have all seen over the last couple of days. People have a lot of misconceptions about what this all is and what it's for and what we're going to do with it and, and so on and so forth. And why should I have to pay for rain when it runs off my property? Um, so it, it's going to be a really big project. But it's uh, unfortunately, it's really the only fair system that's out there. There really isn't any other way to go at this point. Commissioner Pruce, would it be fair to say, I mean, in your research with this task force, that the cost of disposing the water and all of that isn't changing? I mean, as a community, we've always bared that cost, but just how we allocate it among users is changing. Uh, so we're not putting it into the water bill um, like we had in the past based on how much water you use. Um, that we can't do anymore based on the settlement. So therefore, uh, moving forward uh, in the short term, we're um, proposing the ad valorem just to get us through until we can do a study to say, hey, just like, and I hate to use this because it's, it's a close example, but the more water that comes out of your tap, the more water you pay for, the more water you put into the sewer system, you know, the more you're going to pay for, for that discharge based on the runoff on your property. Is that a fair assessment in a nutshell? It is. It is. Uh, two things are important. One thing that the, the task force recognized early on is that stormwater comes from every single square inch of property in the community, not just commercial property, right. which are the ones who are burdened now by the detention requirements. There is property that runs off of Beaumont Hospital. There is there's all kinds of uh, the stormwater volume that comes off of the Meyer property is almost inconceivable at such a high volume. Um, and there's got to be some way in the stormwater utility does this of allocating those costs for discharging that stormwater based upon what runs off of your property. I mean, it, I think it's it's fair so that the, the, someone like a Meyer property would pay significantly more unless they adopted some green infrastructure and reduced the amount that flows off of their property. Um, than, than others who, who don't produce that much stormwater. So there's got to be a relationship between, between those things. But there also has to be, this is something that, that James hasn't mentioned and that I didn't mention either, that one of the things that we thought was very important was in the concept of the utility that are built into it incentives to use, or a system of credits, um, so that if you do install on your property uh, green infrastructure, which reduces the amount of stormwater, whether it's rain barrels or a rain garden or permeable surfaces on your patio as opposed to just cement or, yeah, permeable, and getting a... Yeah, that's the right word. <laughs> yeah. um, so that you get credit for that, so that you're reduced, so that your fees are reduced because of what you've done to your property to keep the rainwater on your property. That's a very, very important component of the utility, and it's got to be built into it because otherwise there's no incentive to do it. Right. Seventy-seven percent of the real estate in Royal Oak right now doesn't have any incentive or non-incentive to to make changes to improve their property other than the goodness of their heart. Right. And the other important thing to understand is I don't know that everyone understands that where the stormwater and the wastewater goes, it goes through Royal Oak system, certainly then through the George Coon and the county drain system, and then ultimately it goes to the city of Detroit. And every single uh, little bit of it goes through their treatment facility before it is discharged to um, the Detroit River. And so from the, the the fees start with the city of Detroit, who charges everyone who discharges into their system a fee for treating their stormwater. Everybody in the whole metropolitan area that uses their system pays those fees because they do the treatment. That's where the treatment occurs. Then they back charge the county system and then us. So that's ultimately what the fees are used for. It's for cleaning the water so that it can get discharged back into the Detroit River, which is where it comes from originally. 
So that's where it goes. It's not like it goes into a pipes and then we don't really know right. what happens to it. That's where it goes and that's what the fees are there for so that the water is clean so that when it goes back into the river, it's clean. Um, and that's, that's what we have to pay for. And unfortunately, ours is mixed with stormwater, which is relatively clean, yeah. um, but it's all combined, and we can't change that. So, stormwater clean isn't, everything. isn't all that clean, but uh, well, yeah, uh, but, yeah, I know, but but we, ours is is by the time it gets to the coon drain, it's mixed with sewage. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Even the parts there are parts of Royal Oak where we have separated sewers but they still all end up in the cone, right. which is combined. And in a lot of properties, individual residential properties, it gets combined before it leaves the property line. Yep. So, you know, it's not combined somewhere down the road. It's combined before it hits the main city sure. sewer. Sure. Again, Commissioner Dubuck, then Commissioner Lasser. Uh, yeah, that is actually the point I wanted to hit on. I think that's the, the thing that really uh, jumped out at me years ago when we started having a conversation about needing to modernize our, our runoff, our stormwater ordinance, is that with the, uh, the overwhelming majority of our city being combined, uh, we're mixing the rainwater with the, the raw sewage, and then we're paying to have it cleaned, which is uh, you know, financially inefficient and also an environmental abomination and right now our the status quo is that uh, for businesses or also uh, apartment complexes if they want to you know repay of their parking lot or something we make them build a big huge tank underground that just holds the rainwater so that our system doesn't overflow um, but then it still just releases the rainwater back into that mixed system so it's, it's not putting it back in the ground it's still paying to mix it with the raw sewage and we send it down to the facility and we pay to have it cleaned um, that's you know that's that's the system we all inherited from from you know previous uh, generations, and I feel like uh, it's certainly time uh, to make a change where the entire system should be geared toward putting as much water as possible back into the ground as opposed to into our pipes. And so I think what we have in this report is a lot of uh, great information and recommendations about how do we encourage uh, not just businesses but residents to use rain barrels and rain gardens and permeable pavement uh, and. and not now we need to build an ordinance based on all this information. Um, you know, I'm, I'm eager to get started on it. I don't think we're going to you know, write that ordinance here at the table tonight. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think we need to set a goal as a part of that, as a community, to inform that ordinance to say, you know, in 20 years we're going to reduce our stormwater runoff by 30 percent, by 40 percent, whatever we're putting into that drain. And so, in the example of, you know, I know there's a, a particular apartment complex that's wanted to repave their parking lot for condo. many, many uh, a condo. They wanted to repave their their lot for a long time, uh, but they'd be slapped with they they would have to build a $500,000 detention center. And what I want to say is. Um, well, I want you to invest in your property, but we also need to improve this situation of runoff. So how about you either build a $500,000 detention center or you implement other strategies that reduce runoff by 40% or whatever we determine is appropriate. And I think that's a better way to run this ordinance because ultimately those detention centers aren't doing us any good. They do prevent backups, but they still put all the rainwater into the sewer just slowly. And that's just terrible policy. So um, I think we're heading to a really positive place place with this with regard to cost we should all ultimately save if we're putting less money into the sewers um, we still have to pay our debt but once we once we start reducing our stormwater runoff then we should all see savings uh, you know there is really no cost increase to folks in this I think it's been thoroughly explained we're just changing the way that we're paying for this based on the, uh, the realities that we've been faced with so uh, I think it's an awesome report it's been a long time coming I think it, it provides the information that we need to start making some informed decisions about where we go with our ordinance that I think will benefit residents uh, as well as, as uh, you know, commercial properties and uh, you know, make us a much greener, more environmentally sustainable city, which I think is something we all universally want. So, all right, Commissioner Levasseur. You got a few questions, and I, I understand you may not have the answers right at your fingertips, but, but just a few things I'm curious about. Uh, looking at the attachment at the top of the seventh page, it talks about 21.1 million dollars, pardon me, 21.1 million gallons of cubic feet of additional detention area since the ordinance was first enacted. Uh, and, and just following up on what Commissioner DeBuck said, I'm kind of curious, do, do we know what portion of that ultimately leads into our drain or versus what may uh, be diverted you know 100 diverted completely from the drain 
I'm pretty certain all of it ends up in the system eventually. Detention just holds it for a short time, and then the idea is to try and slow the flow of the, the water into the system. So, so if we're maxing out the capacity of our uh, sewer system, uh, it's, it's keeping that water temporarily away from the system so it doesn't cause right. a problem. Yep. Right. Exactly. Now, now, do we have a sense of, I mean, that number, 21.1 million gallons, uh, for, for someone like myself who's not an engineer and doesn't necessarily know what the overall capacity of the system is, I have no idea if that's 1%, 10%, 25% of our overall system, how significant that number is. Are you able to comment on that? Um, I'm looking for exactly where you are. Uh, it's right above city and school district property. On which page? Uh, I believe seventh page of the attachment. You know what, I think there's actually a typo there. I think it's 2.1 million. I don't think it's uh, 21. Because I think we, uh, engineering had estimated we were gonna be able to detain about 9 million cubic, uh, cubic feet originally, and we've only been able to detain 2 million. So there's still, if every property that qualifies right now under the ordinance were to improve, we'd be able to have an additional 9 million cubic feet of detention, which would have made a huge impact. Maybe still would have had backups. I don't want to say we wouldn't have had backups during the August 14 flood, but it may have certainly lessened the amount of backups we had. I, I guess what I'm getting at, and, and I appreciate that if we had a perfect scenario and, and every property in the city complied, and if I'm hearing it every, what compliance would mean a detention uh, capacity at each property, right? Which isn't realistic for 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 us. So that nine million, uh, that nine million cubic feet of detention area simply will never happen. Uh, do we do we have a sense of what realistically could happen? I don't know that we do. All right, all right. And, and then the next question is again getting back to the two point <clears throat> two point one million gallons of cubic feet of detention area that has been created, you know, how significant is that in the big scheme of things, percentage-wise? Um, I, I don't have the actual numbers for it, but prior to the enactment of the ordinance, um, basement backups were pretty routine. Uh, the ordinance, I think, was put in place in 1991 as part of a, a multi-faceted effort to reduce stormwater and basement backups. That included the restrictive catch basins, um, so I, I don't have the physical number, but I know that it's certainly been less. It has been effective. No, I think it's probably right. Um, in keep, keeping water out of basements. Uh, the uh, proposal asks us to pass a resolution, which is basically a very generic, let's move forward resolution. And I'd kind of like to get a sense of what that means. Uh, I mean, the, the concept in general may be may be good, that, but you know there could be some details here that, that, that we have concerns about. And I, I want to know what, what it means if we're voting yes tonight. Right. Well, one of the next steps will be to draft an RFP um, to try and, and get a firm to help us write a new ordinance, I believe, weren't we? I mean, that would be one way we can proceed, somebody who can come in and help us out with putting all of these recommendations into a, a physical ordinance. Um, the stormwater management funding, now that's actually another agenda item tonight, um, and the stormwater management planning is going to have to be part of that. And I can get more into that in the next agenda item because that has to do a little bit with um, pending state law as well. Uh, one, one concern I had about the next agenda item, and, and perhaps it ties in here as well, uh, it, it looks like we are basically saying we, we don't want to take the approach of Birmingham, which is to classify properties, which I would think would significantly reduce our overhead if we if we do classification. Uh, your proposal, as is here, would basically be telling staff write up a proposal that 
uh, provides for much more extensive uh, involved uh, analysis of, of every property in town and, and would uh, cut us out of the possibility of adopting more of a Birmingham style? We would have, um, it, would, it would definitely be more intense than what Birmingham did. Birmingham's model was to use um, some sampling data and to set up each property within certain classifications based on size, based on the drainage district. Ours would be much more accurate data. Obviously, yeah, it will cost more. Do we have a sense of how much we might be able to save in administrative costs, overhead costs, if we went with more of a Birmingham style? I do believe it may have been half, half of, of what we're, what we have proposed tonight. Okay, and when you say half, are we talking about the outside engineer? Or are we talking yes. about? Yes. All right, but I'm ta I'm also talking about our staff work in general. You know, just to maintain this utility over time. I don't think there would be that much more moving forward over time because regardless of the model, you're still going to have um, have to give properties the opportunity to appeal their assessment if they feel like they have, you know, say we we figured out their number of uh, runoff and they feel like their number for runoff would be much lower, they have to be able to appeal it. So regardless of whether we have the actual data or we use sampling, there's going to should be the same amount of appeals in theory and the same amount of uh, overhead work that will have to be done to continue to make sure we're accurate. If we vote yes on this, are we locking ourselves in as far as the method that we're allocating costs? Mayor Fournier. Commissioner Perush. I, I apologize for interjecting, but we got the sense at the Stormwater Task Force that um, our attorney who handled the litigation um, has given us a real strong opinion that the Birmingham model would not pass muster for us, given our litigation history, that we're going to have to go with the type of proposal that is here, where each individual property is assessed, which is a part of the OHM proposal, and they actually have spelled out for us a methodology for doing that using aerial photography and all that kind of stuff. So we got the real strong indication from our attorney that we're going to have, as expensive as it is, we're going to have to bite the bullet and go with an individual assessment of every property. Okay. As, as I'm understanding it from uh, James's, James' report, you know, he anticipates that approach is adding another $100,000 or so to the cost of setting this up. And so certainly I'd, I'd like to see a report from council uh, to be convinced that that, that that is the case and not simply, you know, simply support this because of the significant cost. Uh, I got Commissioner Douglas. Yes, the uh, Michigan Municipal League has dealt with this issue and either wrote or has endorsed legislation that has been submitted to committees in the legislature that would shape how communities across Michigan can regulate their runoff. And I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe Birmingham, because they were early on in the lawsuit process, had to craft their ordinance before they had the guidance that this draft legislation offers. Now, we don't know if the draft legislation is going to be approved, but the, the MML staff feel confident that we and other cities who follow these guidelines are going to be on relatively safe ground. Commissioner Dubuck. Yeah, I would just note that you know, with something like this, we certainly want to be uh, ensuring that we're cost effective in our approach, but I want to be penny wise and pound foolish here. I mean, the, the major weather event we had in 2014 did $125 million of damage in the region. Royal Oak increased trash pickup costs from that those two weeks alone afterwards cost us $650,000. All right, the inconvenience and, and the loss uh, uh, of residents' possessions, uh, you know, goes well beyond that you could put a dollar figure on. So if what we're talking about is knowing that there's going to be more weather events and having a system that is much more effective in reducing our overall runoff and reducing the risk of floods uh, to our residents, I think we have to consider value and not just dollar amount. The value is what matters. Well, and a system that works effectively for our residents should be the goal here. Well, Commissioner Perush? You know, I, I have not yielded the floor yet. 
you go paused ahead. and I want to commissioner, are you gonna yield it to Commissioner Lavasser? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Lavasser. And, and just to respond to that, you know, this is not about the system of diverting water from our sewers and how we prevent uh, floods. That's something we're gonna do. That's something that we have to do. This is a question of how do we allocate the cost to do that? And, and what is the best way from an administrative standpoint to do that? And that's what I'm getting at. Do we have to spend this extra $100,000 that may be able to be used in other ways to uh, prevent flooding or to otherwise enhance the quality of life in, in the city? So, so that's why I'm concerned about simply going with a very labor intensive system uh, of you know, classifying homes, I mean, basically, and for folks who are watching this at home, it's basically you've got airplanes flying overhead and uh, in the fall when the leaves are down and basically saying, okay, this house has this much uh, non-permeable surface and that house has that much non-permeable surface and allocating it in that way as opposed to the Birmingham system, which is just basically saying you have a 40 by 100 foot lot, we're going to allocate every 40 by 100 foot lot in a comparable way. That's the Birmingham system. And, and basically to do it in that more precise way, it sounds like it's going to cost us about $100,000 more to do. And, and I would just question whether that's an administratively good choice to make. Commissioner Perush. Well, two things. First of all, we're not reinventing. We're not starting from scratch. There are communities in the state who have this kind of very specific parcel by parcel assessment of their of, of their runoff, and the the most. Uh, geographically close one is Ann Arbor. They use a system like that. They have individually assessed every property. And I, I think it comes back to a question again of fairness. I mean, if you're going to call, if you're going to classify all 50 foot lots in Royal Oak and assess the same fee to them when one has you know, five times as much concrete as the other, or five times as much impermeable surface as the other, to me, that's not fair. To me, the extra money that you spend in order to make it a, 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 as fair a system as possible for each individual property owner is money well spent. Um, and it's not going to be a recurring cost. Um, it's, a, it's a cost that you're going to be able to do once and then have a very good understanding photograph of the city so that you can fairly assess those fees. I just don't think we want to lump a whole class of residential properties or even business properties or industrial properties into one classification uh, when there are very distinct differences among them. And I, I think the extra money is well spent in order to make the system as fair as possible. I'll just add to that too. I mean, with that fairness and that specificity, you're getting the incentive for 77% of our homeowners to reduce the cost of stormwater so they can say, look, I am going to put a rain barrel in. I am going to, you know, make a uh, miniature bioswale at the end of my driveway so the water comes off my driveway into those areas. Whereas if you classify properties, I don't always know what incentive people have out of the gate to actually reduce the amount of stormwater, which reduces what we're paying, which reduces the fees for everybody. So um, I think in this case, you are, it, it, it's, it's a really important question of fairness, um, but it's also how do you um, specifically motivate people to make the changes that they need to make in order to improve the situation? Mr. Macy. Uh, I have two questions. One for Mr. Johnson. Um, so we got an email in February um, about we got a Miller Canfield attorney who had who came and spoke about this issue. Correct. I, I think this is the one who said that this is the Birmingham method is not going to be um, it's not going to hold up. Uh, do we have a report, or could we get a report from that attorney? Sure, we can get a report. Um, and then my question for Mr. Krizan is about, um, this was a question of public comment, I think, was about what is the change going to mean for the homeowner exemption going away? So for the, right now, there's a, there's a one mm -hmm. and two family homeowner exemption for, I believe. <clears throat> That's for, for the detention. Um, one and two family homes right now don't have to comply with the stormwater detention ordinance. So tell me more about now the change will mean. In theory. This, this, uh, the whole thing has been comprehensive. So the homeowner will be able to participate in stormwater management either through um, implementing some type of green infrastructure, some type of detention, or by just being a participant within the stormwater user utility. And this is for construction that occurs on the home? Um, it would be for every property to in total. 
But no, we, no. Don't, we we're just, not related to construction. Yes. In fact, we want to eliminate the connection to construction for business properties as well. That that link has been probably the biggest problem with the stormwater detention ordinance as it is now. Okay, so what does it mean for one family home to comply with the detention? I thought we were getting paying a fee for what? Well, we're talking about completely rewriting how we're going to handle stormwater. So it may not be the detention ordinance anymore. Okay. Mr. Douglas. Well, if I may, and, and maybe I'm not, maybe I'm, tell me if I'm not answering your question. Right now, in the past, we paid through our water bill for rain that fell on our property. We're still going to pay for rain that falls on our property, just in a different way. But if we do things to, and, you know, we will know that we've got X square feet of grass on our property, and so we're, you know, pay a fee based on how much water is going into that grass. But if we have rain barrels or on site detention or retention, then the city will go tick, tick, tick and reduce what we pay. Okay. And that's what you mean by compliance. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's not like, oh, now everyone's going to have to tear up their driveway and put a detention in or install rain barrels. And, you know, the theory is, and it's never perfect because every individual property owner is different. Um, but what, I mean, the cost of the system is, is X. And we, we as citizens, property owners, have to pay for that system. So in the past, um, before July 1st, um, we pay for it, you know, the amount of water you used. You know, you paid for it in, you know, they, there was, it assumed most of that went into the sewer system, so therefore you paid for it in, in that regard. And now, um, for a year at least, we have to do, because of the, the settlement uh, to comply, we have to do the ad valorem, which, as Commissioner Proust said, is not favorable. It's not fair, but it, but it gives us time to take all these elements and put them into an ordinance that does a few things, in my opinion. One, it makes the whole thing much more fair. So, you know, I don't imagine, you know, people are all of a sudden going to see a, you know, oh, I got hit with a thousand dollar bill. No, I mean, they might have paid $50 in their water bill and now they might pay 47, you know, or 52 or whatever makes sense based on those um, adjustments. Um, and then more importantly, we're pushing ourselves as a community to reduce the amount of water into the system that we unnecessarily have to clean. And I mean, that has environmental consequences, but it also has a significant financial burden. So I think by unlocking the, I don't see the residents out of the gate, you know, paying more because the cost of detention isn't going up, or I'm sorry, the cost of stormwater management isn't going up. It's just, how do we better allocate it to the, like Myers, for example, you know, they're, they, you know, I don't want to pick on Myers. So I got to be careful what I say, but, you know, they have a huge expansive parking lot. Um, they're contributing a lot of water in the system that us as residents are paying for to clean it, but they're probably not using as much water inside their building. You know, I'm sure they use more than a household uses, but, you know, they're flushing toilets, washing hands, cleaning floors. You know, the amount that they're putting into the system compared to what they're, you know, paying for is probably a huge disparity. So that means as residents, we're, you know, footing the bill for that situation under the current system even. So, you know, by making sure that if you're adding more into the system, you pay more. And you have all the incentives in the world to reduce it, and that's good because it reduces the cost, isn't reallocated. Okay, so I, I think I'm, I'm not phrasing my question correctly because I'm not quite getting, I'm not still quite understanding. So I'm just reading from this. The current exemption for one and two family residential uses should be removed. The ordinance should require compliance with stormwater management by all new and renovated properties within the city regardless of zoning category. So I, I get right now that we're paying already for stormwater and I get that we will be in the future. I don't understand what this means. So Mr. May Mr. Johnson, I, may I take an attempt at this? <laughs> the point that was 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 attempting to be made is that currently we exempt approximately seventy seven percent. I think so. Of, of all properties from having anything to do with stormwater, and the thirty three percent that we do require to put in detention facilities, uh, we let delay. Uh, basically forever if they don't make physical improvements to their property. The idea of this is that we would write a new ordinance, not something that's specifically stormwater detention, that's a stormwater management ordinance instead. An ordinance with the idea that everybody is responsible for their own stormwater. Okay. Okay. It doesn't mean that we follow the existing pattern at all. So a way to, another way to put that is if you build a new house on a property, um, then 
there'll be an evaluation and it will say, okay, well, you added this much more dry driveway, you added this much more impermeable um, yes. surfaces, so therefore you're going to put more into the system, whereas the... You theoretically could be putting more in, but if you actually take steps right. to reduce what you put in... So if you have a driveway that's all permeable and you have a rain garden and everything like that and you're putting none in, theoretically your yes. bill could go down dramatically. Yes. yes. Yeah. So it does have something to do with construction. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I think I think what, I mean, we don't have all the details of the ordinance, but I think what the tenant of we it is. We don't have an ordinance at all. Yeah, we don't have, we have it. I mean, yeah, things. we don't have anything to, to bring. But what we're saying is the way I read it, and correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe this will help Commissioner Macy, is, um, look, we recognize that 77% of properties are, are really the answer to help limiting the amount of stormwater into the system. And if, you know, it's a you pull a construction permit, maybe that's an opportunity to reevaluate what you're doing with that new build, and okay, it might change your rate. If you want to come to the city and say, hey, look, you know, you, you uh, through, you know, a flyover said that my property does this, but look at these 10 things I put in, lower my rate. We would capitulate and say, yeah, you're putting less in, we'll lower your rate. Um, and then eventually we stabilize. I mean, there will be some work in the beginning, uh, and then we'll stabilize. Um, and that, with the whole goal of reducing the amount, which obviously has financial benefits, Benefits for the homeowner has financial benefits overall for the city, and certainly has great impacts for the environment. But also, you know, we're we're working to keep water out of people's basements, which is a pretty important goal. We forget to talk about, not forget, but we don't talk about as much. Yeah. And it's and it's important to remember. Uh, James did point out in in this that uh, we're all of our stormwater and all of our sewage water is going to one place. And we haven't got control over the capacity of that place. And you know, if that if that gets full, or if, if there's no place for our stormwater to go, so if we can reduce the amount of our stormwater, and we haven't really talked about here is we 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 don't believe the upstream communities are doing as much as we're doing. Uh, I've been told by the engineer of one of the communities that has an ordinance that they don't enforce it. Uh, so that's going to be part of this too is trying to limit how much other people are putting into the clean drain yep. uh, I think I had Commissioner Levat or Commissioner Macy are you I'm just going to finish off Okay. so, so I think I understand now we're, this is basically just wiping clean because we're starting new so I'll stop being bothered by the language um, wiping it clean and starting with new language that incorporate something from everybody. You know, right. every, everybody suffers when this doesn't work, or almost everybody does. And so that's my last question, is that this is this new ordinance will include some of those things we talked about that include credits, so maybe getting rid of some of our ordinances that say we have to have concrete or asphalt for our driveways and encouraging more permeable services mm -hmm. for that type mm -hmm. of absolutely. Yep, use. Okay. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. Now I'm done. Okay. Commissioner Lavasser, and then I have Commissioner DeBuck. I, I think the big concern and thing that people are interested in around town is how will this impact their bottom line? And, and, and with that in mind, uh, you know, there's three comparisons. One, what people, the typical household was paying under the previous system that we can no longer do because of the litigation. Uh, compare that to what they pay under the millage, and then compare that with what they would be paying with without mitigation uh, under this system. And do, do we have any numbers that we can share with people at this point? Not at this point. But the actual total amount wouldn't necessarily change. How it impacts individuals? Yeah, it could change. All right. So, so, so basically, and I forget the number. I want to say 2.5 million, but I might. Help me out if I'm if I'm wrong on what the debt service is on that drain. Well, if I'll accept that, I'm not sure if that's right, right or not. But for for, for, for for discussion purposes, that's fine. For, for some reason, that's staying sta sticking in my mind. So if we're making 2.5 million before off the water bills in a system that we can no longer do, now we're doing it with uh, 1.13 mills, which is actually I believe more like 2.8 million or whatever. Uh, and the idea is that we would be collecting a comparable amount through this system uh, and we would simply do away with the, the millage rate if I'm understanding it correctly. That's now, correct. how that works Although out We for might want to go a step further because what we're, we're dealing with right now is just the George Kuhn drain debt. You might want to choose to take all of your stormwater related costs off of the water bill okay. and move them over here. All right. Now how that works out for, for the average household, I suspect it, this is less than what that millage would be because there's more parties involved paying into the system, whereas we have a lot of 
parties in town that don't pay on the millage. That's true. Some very significant ones. Commissioner mm -hmm. Dubuc? Yeah. I think that's an excellent point that would inform the discussion if we, uh, you know, as we move forward with considering, um, you know, how to build this ordinance, you know, what's the median uh, mill, you know, someone's paying under the mill, what's the 70th percentile, what's the 25th percentile, and see how those compare versus the previous rate and where we'd be going with this. Um, I was originally going to speak to Commissioner Macy's question, which I think she find, she clarified uh, perfectly, which is there's questions that we can't answer yet because we're talking about writing an ordinance. So yeah. how the day the ordinance is enacted, it's going to impact my household or, you know, residents who came out tonight, we can't say because we haven't written it yet. We're just kicking off the process tonight. Uh, but ultimately, if I'm understanding the vision for this, we'd land in a place where there's a specific rate people are paying based on the runoff of their property, and they will have the ability to lower that rate through actions taken on their property by enacting you know, rain barrels, rain gardens, permeable pavement to lower the rate that they're paying. So residents will very much have control over their fates. Yes. But I think we awesome. also agree that the ad valerum is not sustainable. Like it's it's just a, a placeholder here because we have to act immediately to avoid, you know, um, the litigation we're seeing for all the cities that happen to be attached to the Coon drain. So we want to make sure that we um, comply while we're working on this. But, you know, the ultimate goal is to do exactly what Commissioner DeBuck said, make it fair and uh, and lower it, the cost for everybody. Commissioner Perouche? And the other thing that we have to keep in mind and that everyone has to remember is that we have to pay for cleaning that water that yep. goes through the Detroit system somehow. We just can't say, well, we just don't want to do it this year. This isn't a public policy program that we want to continue. We have to do it. And there's very, very, very limited sources for that kind of revenue. One is the one we're using now, which is the millage, which is not a good choice. And then there's the system that we can't use because of litigation. I don't know of any other, <laughs> there, there are no sources of revenue. There's no magic fund out there that you can tap for, for those kinds of, for those kinds of uh, expenses. Um, so you, you really, uh, um, our choices are limited. We either do this kind of a fair system or I don't know where the money comes from. Right. Okay, we have a proposed resolution to accept the report. Commissioner Pruch? I'll move approval of the resolution. Motion by Commissioner Pruch, supported by, or seconded by Commissioner Dubuck. Discussion? Commissioner Pruch? The, the one thing I want to emphasize is that we spent a lot of time with this report, but there are an awful lot of other, other unanswered questions that we've raised tonight um, that we're going to have to answer as this process goes forward. So this is not a be-all and end-all right here, um, but this is a starting point, and these are some basic recommendations that we think are essential in order to make this, this whole program work. Um, but there's an awful lot of information yet that we have to gather and that we have to process and that we have to put into the system. Um, but we can't, because we, we have a year, <laughs> and we are going to need 365 days of that year in order to get this in place and to do it right. And sure, we could spend another month or two, you know, gathering more information, but we don't have that amount of time. We really don't. We have to get moving on this. And so it's got to be a dual process. We are gathering information at the same time. We are moving forward to put this thing in place because otherwise we're going to be faced in January or July 2019 with, oh my gosh, we're going to have to renew the millage um, because we're not done. Uh, I, I, just, I don't think that's acceptable. So we really need to get moving on this now. Agreed. I would just you know, emphasize this is a really uh, awesome opportunity because if we do it right, uh, we dramatically reduce the runoff that we're putting into the sewer system. We reduce the risk of flooding for all of us that live in the city. And ultimately, we, re we reduce costs both in the near term and long term for residents. So, I mean, this can be like a big win if we get it done right. Well, not to mention allowing um, businesses to actually make improvements to their properties and parking lots and participate in this and use, right. you know, maybe in a number of cases, less expensive green infrastructure to achieve their goals and our goals. <clears throat> Mr. Levasco. Uh, I do have concerns over this. I, I am going to support the motion, though, because I do believe that this is better than the millage system that we just voted upon uh, this, uh, uh, I guess it was last month now. Uh, I do have concerns, though, with the method that we're allocating because I, I believe we are 
expending more money than what we truly need to to put together a fair system. All right, so someone's got 10 more feet of driveway than, than, than the next guy. What does that mean? Is that like a $5 a year type of, of situation? Does that warrant us spending an extra $100,000 uh, to have airplanes fly over to, to uh, assess each property in this town? I, I think the Birmingham system would be fine without a report from council telling me that I'm wrong. I'm, I'm not comfortable spending that 100000 Commissioner Douglas? I think the airplanes have already flown over. I mean, I'm looking at Google Maps right here. So um, the work has been done. GIS systems are um, remarkably good at processing this kind of data and assembling it in a way that is useful to us. So I, I mean, I think that work's already been done. And um, the, the technology of collecting that information and assessing these properties is uh, feasible and reasonable. Commissioner Dubuck. I would just say I think this work is done by drones and not airplanes. Having <laughs> <laughs> yeah. tons of fuel. So I would only point out that there's actually two separate agenda <laughs> items and, and we seem scary. to be intermixing the two. Understood. Yeah. And for anyone that wants it, there's a drone in Grant Park that has exactly twelve minutes of flying time and a pine tree there. <laughs> <laughs> Did it get stuck in the pine tree by the driver of said drone or the Pilot. controller? I could blame my daughter, but dad was at the helm, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to call for the... It was not. <laughs> It was a little pricey, but it was like the second one that I've lost on her behalf. So. <laughs> Maybe three. I don't know. If there was a drone license, I would have had too many points already not to drive one. So <laughs> bad choice. Um, well, we got a motion on the table. I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right. This brings us to agenda item 18, approval of OHM advisor's proposal for implementation of stormwater utility. Well, this is the second part where we're actually getting into talking about how right. we're going to do it. <laughs> All right, who's going to kick this one off for us? Mr. Crisen? Okay. Um, so, yeah, we've been kind of already discussing this, but we had um, we had asked OHM advisors, who is one of our um, engineering consultants under contract, to provide us with a proposal for actually doing the work to do the apportionment study to help us with a, a stormwater management plan that would be um, in compliance with the pending state law. So that should that be enacted, we're ready to go. We're we're all set. Um, they have provided us a proposal. The total cost for the work is $226,000. Um, and we've got it for you for approval. Questions, <clears throat> Mr. Crisen? Mr. Lavasser? I don't know if it's a question. I think we already addressed the question. So I, I, I voted in favor of the last resolution. I won't vote in favor of this one uh, for the reasons that, that are stated. Uh, uh, number one, I do, do believe that, that that's $100,000 more that we don't necessarily have to spend. Uh, that's one aspect. A second aspect is I, I note that this did not go out to, to bids. Uh, I know that James indicated that he believes that this firm is uniquely qualified uh, to provide this service, but I'm not aware that we sent out any request for qualifications here either. Uh, so for those two reasons, I will not be supporting this resolution. We did do an RFQ when we brought them on board initially as one of our <coughs> one of our uh, consultants, but we did not do we did not send out a general RFQ to all of the consultants for this specific project because OHM is the one that did the stormwater report and has all the stormwater data. Any other discussion or motion? Commissioner Douglas? I'll move approval of the resolution to contract with OHM advisors on this project for the amount stated. We have a motion by Commissioner Douglas. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Perush. Discussion? We have professional staff that do not take their work lightly. Um, they have consultants who also do not take their work lightly. When it comes to recommendations like this, I respect their work and their decisions and the work of the task force that went into this. And I, I think it's completely right to um, support the proposal that we've seen here. 
Mr. Proosh? The other thing to consider is, uh, as Mr. Johnson said, OHM has done already under the existing contract an extensive amount of work in terms of studying the the whole water stormwater system within the city. Um, and that has a huge amount of value. So if we were to get another engineering firm um, to come in and, and do this work, they would have to duplicate that. And my guess is that the cost would be significantly higher than the 200 and some thousand dollars that we're going to be awarding tonight because they would have to do all over again what OHM has already done and then do this component as well. So the fact that OHM already has a huge uh, volume of data um, that they can piggyback onto in order to complete this contract, I think, is, is something that's fairly significant. And I don't think we need, I don't think we should ignore that element of it. Because if the, we had a completely different person coming in, I could see this contract being twice as much because of the amount of work that OHM has already done that they would have to do all over again. I'll even add to that that, you know, to it's about being agile and moving quickly here as well. Because if we have to wait another two or three months, I mean, we have the person that, or we have the firm that was working on the project. The sooner that we can get this new ordinance in place, that's millions of dollars to taxpayers and, and or utility payers, I should say, um, that we can, you know, get rid of the ad valorem and make sure that we have a fair system in place that um, for residents especially, uh, they don't, you know, it'll be much more beneficial to them. So um, moving as quickly as possible, like Commissioner Proof said, we're going to need all 365 days of the next year to get this done. So, um, you know, uh, I think this is a uh, appropriate uh, step moving forward. All right. Um, I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Motion passes. All right, that brings us to item number 19, which is updates regarding construction fence ordinance amendments as requested by Mayor Fournier and Commissioners Dubuck and Gibbs. Um, I don't know if Mr. Craig's here tonight, no, I don't not. think. Okay, um, so so really the, the, the reason, I was the one that asked to see if we could get this on the agenda for tonight, just to do a quick update on, we made some significant changes to our construction ordinances, specifically with the fences, um, for those of you who may not remember, um, you know, we had some issues with right-of-ways, we had sites that were untidy, unkempt, um, not secure, and we moved forward with a recommendation to put fences nice and clean around those sites. Um, you know, some of the, as things go into play, I think for, for the most part, 95% of it seems to be working all right. But we had a couple concerns brought up to us that, um, you know, might improve the ordinance, uh, make it better. And I wanted to see what staff's opinions were. Specifically, um, some feedback about um, the fence being up and, and when com when the property is near completion, meaning that, okay, uh, the house is built, the doors are on, they're locked. The windows are on, they're locked. Um, there's no dumpsters or debris and it's time to do landscaping and it's time to pour a driveway, a sidewalk, and you need access to that property to make it all work. Um, you know, there are challenges with the way the ordinance is written at this moment, I believe, to be technically compliant where it affords builders to be able to quickly complete the project, which is the goal. We don't want houses under construction for longer than they need to be. Um, and does it make sense to, you know, adjust the criteria to say, okay, once the house is secure, the doors are locked, the windows are on, everything like that, and under certain conditions, okay, the fence can come down and then they can complete the projects very quickly because they don't have to take down the fence, do the driveway, put up the fence, put the gates. I mean, it becomes sort of a you know, um, issue in, in some cases. And so I wanted to understand a little bit more how, what staff felt about it. And it seems like a reasonable evolution of the fence ordinance, but we're bringing it up for discussion. Mr. Levasseur. I, I think it's appropriate that we send staff back to, uh, to review this and to uh, recommend proposed amendment to our ordinance. I mean, this really should be about public safety, not making it difficult for contractors when there's really truly no public safety issue anymore. And that's the, the feedback that I've seen from contractors is, is that they're, they're ready to do everything, uh, they're ready to finish up, but this fence issue is becoming a problem, and making their, their, their life much more difficult with no benefit for the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, so if, if that's a motion that we should make, I, I would move that we direct staff to uh, explore 
amendment to the ordinance uh, to effectuate that, that type of change. But we're talking about amendments specifically related to when the fence can come down. Yes. Yeah. If, if we need, or is it, you know, I mean, yeah, if we have to amend the ordinance or if it's a policy change or whatever, your recommendations are to make that transition better. Um, second by Commissioner Macy. A discussion? Commissioner Dubuck? Um, I, I completely agree. I think we've been making incremental progress over this. I think the report shows that we've revisited this issue three times in the last four years. Uh, and at the outset, we had said we want to, you know, kind of do a little bit at a time so that we don't go too big and create all kinds of havoc. Uh, I think we've gotten a lot of really positive feedback on the, the metal uh, fencing versus the orange fencing, which everyone uh, thought really wasn't accomplishing its job. In my neighborhood, I'm seeing the sites confined uh -huh. uh, to within the fencing. Uh, the fencing is on the other side of the sidewalk, so I've seen very few disturbed sidewalks in my neighborhood during this construction season, which is great. Um, and I mentioned that just to say there, so there were two things we wanted to do, keep the construction site contained and make sure the sidewalk is impeded for the shortest amount of time possible. So as staff is reviewing this, I would ask that uh, they're looking at both the fence, uh, the date the fence can come down, as well as are we being as effective as possible in limiting the amount of time the sidewalks are disturbed? Because those were the, I think, the two primary functions of, insecure. of revisiting this. Um, so uh, I don't think that was included in your uh, motion, though. Was your motion just about the fence? I, I'm more than happy to include that. If you want me to withdraw the motion, then put that in. Well, I think it's... I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, your motion was basically to have staff go back and take a look at the ordinance to make sure that we're still keeping sites tidy and secure, um, but, you know, not hindering the ability for builders to get their projects done effectively and efficiently, you know, especially towards the latter end. Broad enough? Right. Sure. It's broad enough. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's covered in there. Cool. Um, and any issues that the building department's hearing that they want to move forward. I, I think the building department's doing what they're they're told to do in the ordinance, right? So we, mm -hmm. you know, a bit, you just learn. You, you get, you know, um, lessons along the way, and we can tweak things because we have the power to tweak them. Commissioner Dubuck? Just so to inform staffs looking into this, I think there's general consensus that there's probably a date at which it's reasonable for that fence to come down that is not within 10 days of a, C, of a CFO, mm -hmm. which they actually don't even know because then you'd have to be psychic to know when you're within the 10 days of the CFO. So that's specifically what we're asking them to look at as well. And it makes our building department, you know, a little easier to, like, how are they supposed to enforce it, you know? So, okay, we'll give... That a shot. All right. Any more discussion? I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right. We've reached the end of our agenda, unless there's something oh, for the... About how long would we be waiting for a, uh, the recommendation? Are we looking at two weeks, four weeks? Just to be fair, and Mr. Pat is sitting the sole yeah. member of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Four years? <laughs> yeah, 27 years. That's four years in the making. A few more weeks. You're probably looking at two meetings out. Okay, so about four weeks then. Okay. End of August. Thank you. All right, if there isn't anything for the betterment of our community, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved by Commissioner Douglas. Is there a second? Third, second. Second by Commissioner Gibbs. Discussion on this uh, motion to adjourn. No discussion. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion passes. Adjourned. <laughs>